This is Dan Lexi from Dan Schultz Outdoors, reminding you to keep the adventures alive. Hey, this is Darren from My Paddle Repeat, encouraging you to keep the adventures alive. Now on with the show. Hey, everybody. Happy Tuesday evening. Glad you could join us. And uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, geez, here we are. Uh, my name's Dennis. This is Canyon's Outdoor Adventure Show. This is uh, season two, episode number 10. And many of you are here tonight to uh, maybe learn a little bit more about winter camping in a hammock. And uh, I'm sure we're going to accomplish that tonight. Uh, this is Canoe Hounds Outdoor Adventure Show, a show that brings you a lot closer to the great outdoors by bringing you hot topics and the YouTube uh, content creators that you enjoy and watch. Um, we're here live every Tuesday evening at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you're new to this live stream, I thank you for popping in uh, for your first time. And hopefully you'll see the uh, benefit of the show or hopefully you enjoy the show enough to uh, hit that subscribe button below, hit the thumbs up, and maybe leave me a comment. And uh, who knows, maybe exactly what's uh, coming up on future shows and episodes. Uh, let's see here. I'd like to start here but with a bit of uh, news while the uh, live chat over here is populating. We just want to make sure everybody's in here for the uh, start of tonight's guests. Yes, not one, but we have two guests tonight that will be on at the same time. Baird on. Uh, we shared a lot of stories, got to learn a lot more about Jim Baird. Um, it was a, it was a really entertaining show. A lot of stories were really told Jim Baird story style. Okay. You know, he's got his own unique, unique way of, uh, telling stories. And I'll tell you, the guy's a beast, man. Some of the stuff that he's done, uh, Baffin Island and all these other things. Uh, it was a great show. of questions and some great people that popped up on screen after the eight o'clock hour to ask Jim some questions. And I'll tell you some of the questions that come 
So thanks very much for your input. Uh, well, on last week's show, I just want to say that uh, we did have a record number of entries for the swag giveaway. Uh, we had over 80 cor correct answers were submitted to uh, to the, uh, the email uh, giving your answer. And the lucky winners of last week's swag giveaway were uh, Fred and Nina Vanderbart. So congratulations to Fred and Nina. Thank you for your support. And uh, we'll get your uh, your prize out to you in the uh, mail probably within the next day or two. So thanks very much and congratulations once again. I uh, just want to thank all of my channel members. Uh, you've probably seen in the intro that I just finished playing there. We had a few of our uh, channel members. That's a perk of, a, of uh, being a member. We got more coming in. Next week's intro will be a little different because we'll have more uh, more Keep the Adventures Alive uh, uh, calls there from our, our channel members. But uh, thanks very much uh, for your support. You know that uh, your support goes a long way. It helps us do all these swag giveaways and stuff, covers costs of the channel, yada, yada, yada. You've heard of the million. checking out and, or checking us out and maybe becoming a channel member. I can already see, yeah, I can already see that I'm freezing up here a bit there. Uh, I've been having trouble with our internet. I've been on, on the uh, horn with the uh, internet company and uh, nothing seems to be getting done. So I'm going to have to, I guess, scream a little louder because I keep getting a little breakup. So if that happens through the show, I've instructed my guests just to keep going without me. That's cool. Um, Here's a first for Canoe Hounds Outdoor Adventure Show. Uh, yesterday I was on Facebook and I see uh, Mr. Kevin Callen, who's a regular on the show. He writes articles for uh, paddle, paddlingmag.com. And he wrote an article about uh, some of his favorite uh, YouTube feeds or uh, canoeing uh, channels that he watches and recommends. And we made the list. Uh, just uh, very exciting news because the company that we were holding or that we're uh, in there with are actually channels that I look up to for inspiration and for, for doing all this type of thing. So thanks very much, Kevin and uh, paddlingmag.com. Appreciate the, uh, the mention in your article. That was awesome. Uh, just want to do a quick shout out to a couple of our channel affiliates. First one that I always mention here is obviously very important for this show is my coffee supplier. It's the Backcountry Coffee Company. And uh, tonight I'm drinking some Anono's Espresso Roast which is a very nice, uh, obviously, espresso blend, and it's all fresh. I like doing that in my little percolator thingy here, and it works out really good. So thanks, Kyle, for that. Also, the guys from uh, Kid Products, uh, makers of the Kid Twig Stove, uh, your ongoing support is always, always great, uh, graciously accepted. And uh, let's see here. We also got uh, great signs and graphics. They're responsible for all of our printing and swag and stuff like that. And then we have a new member on or a new sponsor on the show, which is the uh, Short Hills Beard Company. And they make uh, beard balms and beard oils. And they thought I was looking a little scruffy and thought I needed a little help. So they actually sent me across some uh, beard balm and uh, beard oil. And I'll tell you, yeah, it's helping, but I still need a trim. Anyways, uh, let's see here. Just as a reminder too, uh, We'll get through this. I could see our, our chat's getting pretty full there. Just a quick reminder, we do have still our uh, iron-on patches are available, one for $6, two for 10 If you buy two, I'll also throw in a bonus decal pack, uh, and I'll include shipping and tax. So you can't beat that. It's a great deal for the uh, Canoe Hound Adventure supporter, and it makes a great stocking stuffer. So if you're interested, canoehound at gmail.com is where you want to send your order. Uh, let's see here. Two more things. Uh, once again, if you have any hot topics that uh, you would like us to cover on the show or guests that you'd like to see on the show, uh, please do drop me an email at canoehound at gmail.com. I would be more than happy to uh, try and set that up for a future episode this season and uh, make things happen. Uh, we do have a lot of great shows in the works for uh, coming up into the new year. And actually, you know what? Uh, not next week's show, but the show after is actually going to be our 50th episode. So uh, hopefully you guys can tune in for that there. I got something a little different planned. It'll be like a Christmas show. Uh, very relaxed. I'll bring a lot of you up here on screen to uh, to sort of coerce. And, you know, we could have a great evening with that. So we'll, we'll kind of, that'll come down to pipe anyways. And one last thing. Tonight's show is very interactive. Okay. If you have any questions for uh, myself or our guest tonight, please do put the word 
question before your question so I could identify it. But do it in capital letters. It makes it easier for me to see. Or you could wait until after 8 o'clock. And I'll invite many of you up on panel where you can actually come up and ask our guests any questions that you have. Keep it to like one question, maybe a rebuttal, if uh, you know, a follow-up question, if uh, you know the answer creates another question. But uh, yeah, we'll kind of get that going, and uh, we'll have a lot of you up here on screen. Don't be shy; it's a great way to meet uh, somebody that you might watch on YouTube quite often. Okay, guys and gals. So uh, let's have a great evening of it all. So, without further ado, let's get into the reason why we're here tonight. <clears throat> Tonight's guest uh, was on the show last season, and we learned a lot more about him. Uh, this time around, he's here to share all kinds of tips and advice on the topic of winter hammock camping, his entertaining char characteristics from back in his circus days, add a whimsical flair to his very popular YouTube channel named Suge Emery. Many consider him the godfather, the godfather of hammock camping. Please welcome to the live stream, Sean Emery, a.k.a. Shug. Hey! Yes, sir. I reckon I don't know nothing about no godfathers. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I could have said the Cappy Coleman's. No. Well, I'm Cappy. Yeah, I'm working on a Cappy painting right back there. I was out painting all day. Uh, hey, good to be here. Hey, everybody that's uh, on the chat here. That was amazing to, while I was in the green room before I popped out behind the curtain here. And just seeing who was uh, on there, it's, uh, it's quite impressive. I recognize a lot of those names from Hammock Forums and YouTube and watching your show. So hello, all you Canadians and all you Americans. And I saw it hey, from Scotland. And uh, you know, I, I still hear about your en entrance on the last show there when you were running around in the back. Hey, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? <laughs> Whimsical. <laughs> Whimsical. Yeah. So we have another guest down here in the basement. And uh, our, our next uh, guest is the owner and operator of the Little Shop of Hammocks located out of Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Uh, he produces high quality hammocks. Under quilts and other hammock accessories, please welcome to the live stream, Mr. James Jackson. How are you doing, James? Hey. Hello, everybody. Hi. Hello, James. <laughs> Thanks for making it work. I know you had a lot of commitments today, and uh, it's great that you're able to uh, to swing it to uh, come on out and uh, share some of your knowledge with us. Oh, yeah. No, it was just a matter of uh, getting home. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Timing's everything. And uh, this close to Christmas, you try to squeeze in as much as you can. So, no, yeah. glad to be here. Glad I can make it. So yeah. Okay, okay so I have I have no real itinerary for tonight. Now we had we had a, yeah. a winter camping special about two weeks ago, uh, where we had a whole panel of people and we covered a lot of clothing and we covered like you know warmth, food, and blah blah blah. And we had a lot of hammockers in the in the in the live stream over here that were watching and are saying, "Well, when are we going to get to the, the the hammocks? When are we going to get that hammocks?" And we went into like overtime big time we were like 45 minutes overtime into the show and i said you know what i'm going to try and put together a show and it's going to be just dedicated to winter hammock camping and fair enough suge agreed to do the show and james agreed to do the show so let's make this happen okay let's start where, what are the basics of winter camp, hammock camping where, where do we start if you're if you're a new person into this and you you want to get a start in it where do you start Shug, we'll start with you. Well, honestly, when I moved to Minnesota, well, my wife's from Minnesota, and we moved here from New York City. And I realized that uh, over half the year here, it's frozen and snow covered. And it was a necessity. It was either go camping or not. So, you know, winter is a little different to everybody. You know, there's uh, you know people in Florida tell me it's 60 degrees and they're wearing a jacket. So for me, it was just getting out there, I, I discovered how beautiful the woods were, how bad my equipment was. Had to think back to my scout days of just going, I've shivered through a night before. I know I'll live. And, uh, you know, if you really want to get into it and, and you know, I really, I'm no expert. I'm just a guy that goes. I, I go because it happens here. And I feel like anybody can go. But number one, I think know your gear. And number two, have the confidence going out. Don't be don't be nervous about getting out there. So if you go out with hesitation, it's one of those things like if you're in the woods and you keep dwelling, you know, if you think you're going to be cold sleeping, you probably will. You have to think, oh, I can't wait to get in. I know I'm going to be nice and warm in there. You know, it's it's a bit of a mindset. Mm -hmm. 
So with with that with that being said, uh, when you're first getting started, do you, do you suggest a person just packs up and heads into the back country, or where would you say the person should do their first overnighter? Well, my buddy Hickory and I, uh, we, we went to, he was living up here at a while, staying with us while we were, we had bought this house and he's a, he's a great carpenter and we were working on it. And we went out to a, a local state park and we just had our, our North Carolina boy scout, 45 degree bag. And we just doubled things up and slept in this little tent he had. I mean, we were almost to that point where we were hugging each other at night because we kept laying there going. Are you are you warm? And I'm going. I'm not warm. I'm not dying, but I am shivering a little bit. But you know, we get up at four thirty in the morning and get a fire going, and you know, try to thaw out these cans of tomato juice, and you see what freezes. We weren't scared we were going to die, and then we took another trip up to the Boundary Waters and went up there and, and learned a lot. You know, uh, we literally got our buttocks handed to us, but we stayed out there for five days and loved it and said, you know, if we're going to keep doing this, I realized I've got to sort of, uh, and this is pre hammock days. This was still tent camping. I, I got to really do some research and figure out how to do this a little warmer. And, you know, now I'm 62 years old and I don't want to be cold like that in the woods again, you know, unless it was a survival situation th that I had to go through, I could deal with it. But if it's my choice to go out there and enjoy it, no, nah, I'd like to be warm. And, and, and another thing I think when we have these hammock hangs, sometimes these frozen butt hangs up here, I've seen people come from other states and they they focused on their hammock gear a lot, uh, getting it, you know, it's going to be 22 below. And they're going, well, I have a 20 degree under quilt. And I was thinking about throwing a yoga mat in there. Do you think I'll be warm enough? And I'm like going, ah, probably not. I don't think you'll die. <laughs> but uh, a lot of us have gear that we could loan you. And some people love to take the gear. Other people are a little bit too prideful to take it. Uh, but the big fail for most of these people and even some local folks is not considering their clothing system because you're outdoors, not in the hammock for, you know, most of the day, you know, 12 to 14 hours, 16 hours on these hangs hanging around. And the minute you get away from the big fire, sometimes you realize, how cold it really is. Yeah. I think that's where people have suffered probably just as much as sleeping in their hammock and, you know, being a bit cold in their hammock. Yeah, for yeah. sure. I, I, I always suggest to people uh, your first camp should maybe be in your backyard. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, you run into a problem while you run in the house, right? And then you learn to adjust. You, you adjust the next day or the next time you're going to do it. And like you say, you want to make sure your gear is the proper gear, right? Uh, well, I have those people that are enthusiastic and want to jump in, uh, but I've gone over to a few people's sites and said, look, there is no shame in bailing. You know, if you are miserable and we're doing all we can for you and your feet are just frozen and you've tried everything, you know, you know, I will just be honest with them and go, I think your equipment is not up to the task here for as cold as it gets up here. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, these are the sub, you know, sub 20s and and colder that I've seen some people on. So it's like, don't be a hero. Yeah, I, I know for me, I didn't have a, a lot of people around me um, when I got into hammocks, right? So I actually didn't do a whole lot of winter camping, to be honest, it was all kind of three season. And then it just kind of just sort of blew up from there. And then, yeah, my backyard is where I started. And I tell people, you know, get the small questions out of the way first, like, all right, so it's a couple degrees below freezing. You know, are my lungs going to freeze? Like the stupid questions. Um, I remember thinking this, going, "All right, well, I mean, what's going to happen here if I'm if I get too cold and stuff?" And and being from a farm, you'd think that I would know better, but it's actually as soon as you start taking yourself out of context and putting yourself into somewhere else. I remember, I think it was uh, probably minus ten Celsius, so we're looking at around ten Fahrenheit ish, right? And uh, yeah, and, and just trying out the gear and just thinking, okay, well, fear factor, I can remove that. If I get cold, I just go inside. But then, you know, the colder you go each time, you just push yourself a little bit further, you know, your gear, but you also start to realize that, you know, hey, it's not, I'm not going to die here, so I might as well figure this out, right? So, yeah, you, you have to start somewhere, and I think your backyard is perfect. Whether or not you can actually, you have, you know, trees or some way to hang it back there, but... Uh, I guess it's no different than having a car that you can run to and turn on and get some heat if you really need to bail. But 
I tell you, it's a lot nicer being able to get into the house and thinking, oh crap, now why don't I whip up a water bottle or something, right? Uh, it's easy to start. And then I remember, it, I always think back to, uh, uh, I used to volunteer at my son's high school and they had an outdoor program. And I remember the leader guy, he takes them on canoe trips and everything was awesome. And he's like, okay, we're doing a winter camp. And I'm like, all right, I'll take my hammock and stuff. And But if you think about these kids, what you know, they're told to bring the basics. And these are, you know, intense, right? So, yeah, if you don't have a winter sleeping bag, that's fine. Bring two sleeping bags. You know, you don't have to buy the best right off the bat. Just figure it out and get out there. And then you're not going to, like Shug said, you're not going to die. You're going to be, think of yourself as one of those sleeping bags. Yeah, I've got a, a zero degree sleeping bag. Uh, sorry, Celsius, 30 degree sleeping bag Fahrenheit. I'm getting better at this. Uh, yeah. But that's not the comfort rating. That's the, uh, that's the you're going to be cold, but you'll be okay. And just think you've got a little bit more to go before you get to that extreme. You're going to be freaking freezing, but you're not going to die. So you, you, your body is pretty good. And comfortable, you'll wake up. You'll figure out something. But I, uh, I kind of envy all your hangs up, uh, down in the States because you have so many people around you that you can fall back on for experience and for, and for gear. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I ramble. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll, I'll ask you this, Shug. T tell us about your first winter camping experience in a, in a hammock. Oh, in a hammock. Was uh, it a success? It, it was pretty much, you know, of course, you know, one of my favorite things is when I go to one of these hammock hangs we have here, you know, where it's a lot of people from hammock forums and we all meet in the woods and the one in Minnesota used to be more of a hike in. You'd hike in a couple of miles. We would sort of follow some snowmobile trails and meet out in the woods in Finland, Minnesota. And it was a little harder for people to bail, but of course you could. And, you know, you talk about this, um, what we were talking about in the green room, which is this little room, everybody, that Dennis has that he locks us in. And we have a chit chat before the show about what may happen. Uh, and, you know, people come up to me going, hey, uh, Shook Dara, would you uh, come over and check my hammock rig and uh, see if I got it set up? And all right. And I go over and look. And unless I see a glaring error, like their hammock is just hung foot low or something, I love helping people with their underquilts because um, I usually look at it and go, OK, you've got a 40 degree underquilt, but you've brought three closed cell foam pads that you've laid in there. So you're probably going to get some condensation, but you're probably going to be pretty warm. Get them set up as I can. And I go, here's what we'll do. Only thing I can help you with is in the morning, let's just have a debrief about it and see how you slept. So I'll be down by the fire or something or see them down by the fire in the morning and go, say, hey, how'd it go? And they usually go, and the voice is kind of high. I'm pretty good. <laughs> pretty good. You know, I see them by the fire with their boot right up by the fire. And I go, so were you cold anywhere? They go, uh, yeah, feet. Feet were cold. It seems to always be uh, feet are going to fail. And, you know, even in the tent days, when Hickory and I did our first camping trips here, we didn't know that you had to sort of double your insulation pads or that these minus 30 pads even existed. We just had crappy summer gear, you know. Um, so the thing is going, OK, now we got a place to start. Your feet are cold. So make sure that they're as warm as they can be when you crawl in. Let's you got a jacket or something in your pack. Let's put it over the foot box or your top quilt or sleeping bag. You know, let's, uh, yeah, but I was wearing 15 pairs of socks. And you go, well, that, that's the problem. You can't over sock. So there's this, there's this science in what you sleep in. You know, it's, you know, it's got a lot of room for error. And occasionally you get the hammocker that they just don't have their underquilt set up right. You know, they had cold spots, even though they, they had a, you know, a zero degree underquilt or something. So, you know, it's fairly complicated, but it feels great when you see somebody get it. And that second night, they actually come down and go, yeah, my feet weren't cold. You know, I tried just wearing one pair of loose wool socks and put my jacket over. Or maybe they threw a, a hand warmer, a pocket hand warmer down there. But it's like run in place, uh, do some jumping jacks. Don't crawl in cold or you will be cold. And the other thing is telling a few people sometimes going, Look, if you're freezing at four in the morning and you don't think you're going to get warm and we all fight that thing of getting out of our bags, you know, whether it's to pee or get up, just don't fight it. Get up, go down to that fire, stoke it up. There's tons of wood down there. Get warm, make a hot drink, 
run around, walk in circles. But, you know, we all do fight that. So it's a, uh, you know, it's, it's not for everybody. And in fact, I had a guy comment on my YouTube last night and I get this a lot. You winter camp wrong. <laughs> Cause I'm in a hammock. And uh, for me, the joy is trying to see if I can pull it off in the hammock. And I, I typed him back and said, look, I'm not a dummy. I check weather conditions. I'm not going out in a blizzard. You know, I was a scout forever. I always walk my perimeter and go, okay, I could take this limb. I could put it up under my tarp. If worse goes to worse, I could go and lay under that fallen tree and make myself a survival shelter. You know, I could build a fire, but it's like, uh, I'm sort of going out for pleasure. So if it's really calling for super windy, super snowy conditions, I may just wait for another time to go. Mm -hmm. So uh, actually Andrew Fishing is asking, what's the biggest mistakes uh, you know, that beginners are making these days or that you would consider? Hmm. Well, I, I think it's, you really gotta have that confidence and you really gotta think about all your systems. You know, just, just water, you know, I always tell people, Get some reflectic, make a thing for your water bottle because, you know, water's going to freeze after a while and we need water out there. And whether you got a fire or a white gas stove or however you gather your water, it's not going to, if you just stick it out in your Nalgene bottle, you can put it down in the snow. People say that works. I found it works to a certain degree. I've stuck it in the snow. I tried it in that minus um, way cold trip I did. You know, it was like minus 40 till my uh, Fahrenheit till my little thermometer goes lower limit at minus 40 LL. And I tried that trick going out, bury it in the snow and it still froze. So I think there's a window there where you're safe or not, but water management, closed system, constantly taking things on, putting them off your head, your hands, your wrists, your neck, your feet, keeping those warm. And, you know, it, being so that you can enjoy the conditions out there, you know, uh, working on your fire building skills or going camping with people that are really good at fire building skills, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So what is the coldest temperature you ever, you ever camped at Shug? Like, I, I was, I was just watching one of your older videos the other day. Yeah. I, at minus 40 Fahrenheit. And minus 40 Fahrenheit. Uh, yeah. I was sitting around there. I think, that, I think that's the same as minus 40 Celsius. Yeah. And that's so. where yeah actually that's where they came, <laughs> right? Yeah, minus, 40. minus 40. So it's the same for you guys, eh? Um, hey. I, you know, I was looking at the weather. We had a really good cold snap coming on. And I lived down here in St. Paul, Minnesota. And we were getting to like minus 29. And I kind of was looking, oh, let me look at Ely, Minnesota. And it said minus 40. And I was going, ooh, I want to go up there. It wasn't calling for snow. wasn't calling for high winds. It was going to be a crisp crack in minus 40. So I called my uh, buddy Strung out because I didn't want to go alone. And I'd met him on a hang. And uh, he's a snowboarder and just has a crazy bend to him. And I said, let's go do this. You know, let's go see if we can pull it off in hammocks. You know, we we're only about two and a half miles in. We could have bailed if we needed to. Um, the fact that it wasn't windy was a lifesaver because the day we hiked out, we we're hiking out about minus 32. We turned this corner on the trail and this wind just hit me in the face. And I went, oh, oh, hmm. that would have changed a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to see if I could do it in a hammock. That was my main purpose. You know, it's just, uh, could I, I knew I just wanted to, I was stacking my gear to, you know, putting my gear together. I, I made a pod system and I kind of went out there going, I think this will work. I got a 20 degree Western Mountaineer and sleeping bag an Alpine light that is a wide mummy. And I'd rigged it up over my hammock before. And I had my zero degree war bonnet um, Yeti in there, partial under quilt. And I used a zero degree top quilt inside. And I was kind of trying to do the math going, a 20 degree, zero, I go, it's going to be minus 40. I'm bad at math. I'm going, I guess I'll know whether it worked or not. I slept. I look back at that video and I see myself up the second morning after that 40, minus 40 night. And I always do this morning report from the, have my breakfast from the hammock and have my pop tarts and, uh, you know, make my medallia d'oro instant espresso. And I'm sitting there talking to the camera because that's where I usually do my big sort of debriefs. And I'm sort of sitting up with my orange down jacket. It was like minus 32 at that point. And I'm just, I look so comfortable. I look back at that and go, I don't know what that was. 
Because even last <laughs> week, when we got back from our three night trip, you know, you get home and take a shower and you're hanging around the house. And Meg wanted to go out to the fire pit. And I'm going, I'm cold now. You know, you just spend all these days in the snow and you get home and you turn into a big baby. Oh, I got to chill. So uh, that was successful and it was really fun and it was otherworldly. It was just like it was like being on the moon. Now the cold, the cold is nothing to take uh, to take lightly either. In that in that video that I watched where you camped and it was like minus forty degrees, right? You actually at the end of the video you showed you actually had the onset of frostbite on one of your fingers, right? I had frost nip on this finger, and what I realized it was, you know, because I look back and I see myself just wearing my little gloves with my fingers cut cut off, and I mean it never got. I don't think we ever even in the daytime it never warmed up past like minus 30, you know, and we're mm -hmm. romping around and I'm looking at myself with my hands out. But what it was, was picking up my aluminum hillbilly pot and handling that Bob Dostradi saw, just touching that aluminum, just touching that aluminum over and over. I think that's where I got the frost nip on my finger. You know, I didn't mm -hmm. have any, it, it hurt and sort of turned black and peeled, you know, for about six weeks. <laughs> uh, I don't really feel it ever, but you know, lesson learned about handling the pots and just handling things in that cold. Mm -hmm. uh, Brandon Jay's asking, outside your sleep system, top quilt, under, under quilt, et cetera, what's the most important favorite piece of gear in your opinion for the winter? And he wants us all three to answer this one. You want to start with that one, James? Ooh. That's hard because uh, right off the bat, winter camping with my hammock, it's just like, all right, what's my underquilt? What am I doing here for my insulation underneath? Because really, once you got that, everything else can be sort of, um, hmm. if it's super cold, uh, I really like having uh, an Algene bottle or, a, you know, one of those for a, a hot water bottle. Um, just because I, actually, we were talking about this on hammock forums. Uh, I think, um, the getting cold at three or four in the morning type of thing. And uh, I get into the hammock and I usually, if it's that cold, I'll have a hot water bottle and I'll usually toss it into my hammock, you know, half an hour or 20 minutes before I even get in there. So everything's just sort of started to get warm. And then I'm usually in a base layer and no socks, right? And for some reason, as soon as I start to add more clothes on, I get cold. So um, yeah, that hot water bottle just makes everything nice and a good set of boots my feet get cold from standing around chatting you know that's probably that's probably it other than the sleep system yeah i like my hot water bottle pretty simple <laughs> we we will talk yeah. about the, the clothing and clothing storage in, in uh in a little bit there too because that's something i, I really want to learn about but what about yourself shug what's your uh another favorite piece of gear mine were for winter camping is investing in a good pair of muck lucks you know mm. Uh, eventually after trying it, you know, I was as guilty as anybody. And I, I used them on my last trip. There's, they're an old pair of keen growlers, you know, they're insulated winter boots. They're, you know, they're like a pack boot. They're lighter than a Sorel. Um, and I wore them on my last trip last week. I did for the long, first time in a long time, I put my bread bags. I made myself a little vapor barrier, put a thin sock, a little grocery sack, and then a sort of a medium sock, mainly to keep my boot dry. Because I've hiked in those boots in winter and your feet sweat so much, you just, it, they're just soaked. You'd actually feel like you have liquid in your boot. And, you know, of course you get these kind of boots and it says, good to minus 40. Well, they're, I think they're kind of talking about an active minus 40. They're not talking mm -hmm. about a sitting around for hours minus 40 or minus 20. So investing in a pair of mucklucks, I got some mucklucks, a couple of hundred bucks, broke them in the wool liners. And on that minus 40 trip, when I first got out there, I put two pairs of wool socks on, the rag wool socks. And I realized my feet weren't warm. I was going, my feet are kind of cold. And I started thinking back to, to all the you know directions I read on the on the Steger site. And it kept saying, one good pair of socks. So I whipped them off, took off one pair of wool socks, instant warmth. You've got to have a little air in there, you know, a little got to have a little room for that warm air. And the minute I took off the two socks and just went to the one rag wool sock, big old long one with a hole in the heel and everything, instant warmth and my feet were never cold again. And, you know, I swear if your feet stay good, of course you don't want your hands to freeze. You can't do anything. 
you know, with the hammock, trying to work your suspension. You know, you really want to take care of your hands. And they're kind of obvious. You know, there's a lot of tricks. Keep layering your gloves. Get them by the fire. You know, million things. But warm feet, boy, it's just such an enjoyable trip when your feet are good. So those mucklucks. Yeah, that's my that's probably my favorite piece of winter gear. Yeah. And feet are hard to warm up once they're cold, too. Like you they said, are. your hands, you put them in your pockets, put them in armpits or whatever. You can usually get them working. You take a break from setting up your hammock or whatever. But if your feet are cold, you're you're miserable. If they're really are. wet. As soon as you stop moving. Strung out you know, talking a good snowboarder trick of kind of slinging your arms. Just, you know, take yeah. about a minute. Just kind of keep slinging your arms down with a fairly good snap. And it sort of throws that blood to your fingertips. Yeah. Get that warm your circulation. Yeah. Quite effective, actually. You know, it helps among everything else. But putting on a good pe pair of choppers or your serious, you know, like every time I'm camping, I kind of use a, a glove layering system. I'm always taking one off, put it in my pocket. I have one thin pair. They're these uh, minus 33 brand kind of merino wool gloves that stay on my hands. And I, I cut the tips out of these two fingers in the thumb about halfway down so I can do everything. But sometimes I'm in my chopper mittens, you know, and I just practice doing chores like the lobster man. You know, you gotta, you don't have any finger use, but you can really do a lot. You just have to slow down and take the time to do it. But those, when I start to feel my hands get noticeably cold, I slip into those, sling them around and get them warm. And that, that's that been really effective for me. Yeah. The, yeah. the one thing I, I like, uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a pretty simple piece of gear is uh, hand warmers. Uh, you know what? Uh, every every winter, I go to my local Costco or maybe what is it, Samco in the states or whatever. Or you go there and you buy you can buy a whole case of them or like a big box of them for twenty five dollars or something like that, right? And to carry, always have a couple packages of them in your pockets, even when you're sleeping. Uh, you never know if you do need uh, need one. You know you, you got to be careful because they say they can burn you type of thing. I've never had one burn me personally, but you know, if you could get those things going, it could be a lifesaver in a situation, right? The hands get cold, always have one going in your pocket. You can get the hands in the pocket for a bit. If you had to, you could drop one in the toe of your boots or actually, what do they say? Uh, on the top of your foot is probably the best place where all the veins are, right? That's, that's why a few times I've slipped them in my glove right there on my wrist where yeah. all those Veins are, veins are shallow. I mean, that, that, that really helps. But I, I bring them for my camera. I have a little pouch I made. <laughs> yeah. and I keep one in there, even though I've, yeah. you know, I don't want to keep unzipping five layers to get my camera that's up against my body. So I just have this little pouch and one little tiny hand warmer in there will keep it sort of going all day long. I can just kind of slip it in the pocket. And if I'm getting ready to do a shot and I'm not going to be doing the shot for a while. I sort of set my camera on there and I slip that little bag over the camera till I'm ready to go. And it, it does help keep that battery warm, you know, but I keep all the batteries in an inner pocket up against my chest. Uh, same with my cell phone because those phones will just die out there in that cold. So I sleep with it up against my body, but I do have a little bag with a pocket ham warmer for that too. Sometimes when I'm hiking just to mm -hmm. keep that warm in the day, but you know, you, you learn a little something every time you go and you, you can't be afraid to up your game. Uh, like I told you in the green room, I've been watching a lot of Canadian canoe videos lately. And, you know, now that I'm retired and winter's coming, I look at I, I bought myself a Grand Forest Brook splitting axe. Mm -hmm. I've yet to have myself on it. But this is my Christmas present that uh, I'm already I'm already using, but I will slip it up under the tree for myself. And uh, I've decided I'm, I don't build a lot of fires just because I'm lazy. I can. I was a scout. So I've been trying to build them more in my videos because I had so many people. Well, Shook never has a fire. Does he hate fire? Shook can't build a fire. And I'm going, no, I don't. I was, I was pretty warm. I was just kind of too lazy to do it. But this winter, I'm really uh, crocky. I'm going bushcraft. I'm going to get myself some camo, start wearing a knife on my hip. And uh, <laughs> get myself a lot of paracord and do some stuff with it. Yeah. But uh, no, I feel like you. There's always a chance you go, and it, I'm kind of excited about it. Like bringing, depending less on my stove and a little more on the fire. Uh, so that has me kind of excited about winter. And I think we always need to keep an open mind. And you know, it, it's really easy, particularly when you're like me and you're in your 60s. You know, you're real. I'm set my game to change your game a little bit. And 
and learn from other people and go, yeah, I'm going to do that more. That'll, I'm really looking forward to bringing a little wood stove more to uh, boil some water uh, before I get my big fire going, which I, you know, as we all know in winter camping, that takes some work sometimes, yeah, depending on the wood you have and uh, clearing the fire pit and getting the wood and all that. So, uh, yeah, uh, it makes me excited about winter camping, just trying some new things this winter. Mm -hmm. I always no. thought of the fire, the fire prep and all that is a good way to stay warm when it's freezing out. You know, you're, you're sawing, you're sawing wood, you're chopping, you're, you're splitting it for whatever, but it sure warms you up. Well, the, what do they say? Yeah. Wire, uh, fire, not wire. Wire. Uh, <laughs> wire. Fire warms wire. You it really warms you doing camp chores. But when you get out there and really start hauling and chopping and sawing, you warm up so much. You know, you're peeling off yeah. the layers. Then you got this big burner going. And, uh, and and once you got that cold bed and that fire's just kicking off the heat and giving you the fire sleepy face, when your face <laughs> is just kind of drying out your eyes and you're just kind of all dry going, I got to go crawl in the hammer. Right now. I get there. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's like, and then you got to lift your foot up and try to go, that fire pit's too high. I got to, <laughs> um, I just got to cramp on my leg doing that. Um, <laughs> drink some water, drink some water. Yeah. I used to be a contortionist <laughs> in the old days. Yeah. So I don't know, winter camping, you know, I know a lot of people said they'd never do it. A lot of people are interested in trying it. It's a lot better if you have all the gear, but if you don't have all the gear, just try it somewhere where you can bail out. You know, go to a state park and sleep out. I do think it's good to go somewhere where you have to commit to the night because it is easy in your backyard to just go in. But if you That's go, true. There and go a half mile in, you know, your car's a half mile away. Um, you know, you'll be laying there going, I'm cold, but I don't want to get out. I got to walk a half mile. It's dark. You'll just figure out a way to do it. But there's always get out, run in place, do some jumping jacks. That works really good. Get up and make a hot drink. Um, in winter, I often keep a candy bar up in my little mesh storage bag. A coffee crisp, by the way, because they're so nice to eat in the winter. Because, you know, the bear should be hibernating. You have to worry a little bit less about your food. And I'm kind of going, I guess I'll take the risk. And at three, if I get up to pee, I'll just crunch that coffee crisp down. And, you know, at least you feel like you're getting some fuel in your body because you're going to sleep so early in the winter because short days, long nights, I just feel like your body's depleting, you know, staying warm. So I, I think that helps. I, I always get this impression watching a Shug video that you really like to sleep. I, <laughs> I do. You go, oh, I slept 14 hours last night. <laughs> I think I said on one of my last videos, I said, I should be ashamed of this. But, you know... <laughs> Crawling into the hammock at like 7.15 because it's dark. I mean, you've done everything you can, particularly on a solo going, I'm just making stuff up now. I'm just going to go to sleep because I never do this at home. And my wife goes, God, I'm so jealous of you getting that amount of sleep. And I just go, <laughs> well, the world is not on my mind out there. You know, I don't have to get up and do things in the real world. I just have to get up and have my breakfast from the hammock and and not die that day or or walk my next route or whatever I'm doing, stay in camp. I mean, no big deal. I'm, I'm a backpacker. It's not like, uh, you know, I'm out for 17 days. Now that I'm retired, I can take longer trips, but I love that sleep. And a part of it is just being in the hammock that it just conducive to sleep for me. Mm -hmm. I seen somebody earlier there, I, 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 going back in the chat here, I can't really find it, but somebody was asking about, uh, how, how do you get changed when you're out there hammock camping? God knows it, it's, it could be difficult enough in the, in the summertime, you know, when you, if you haven't got something to stand on, but in the wintertime, obviously you're, you're fighting the cold elements, right? And if it's minus, minus 40 degrees, like you've camped in, right? Well, I'll, how, how do you get changed? How do you change? Like, because you want to get rid of all the damp layers before you're ready to go to bed. Well, I'm at minus 40. Here's here's a realization I had. So uh, Strung Out is one of these. He's a pyro, you know, we were putting <laughs> a lot of wood and he did a lot. So we had this big banked up fire. I mean, we had a huge fire. You know, and when you're sitting down, it's minus 40, you're sitting by the fire, you're kind of getting cocky. And then my hammock was maybe, I don't know, uh, 60, 70 feet back in the woods. And you walk over to your hammock in that cold, you go, Oh my God, it is freezing. This is serious. So, you know, we had on, we'd already changed from hiking out, you know, just didn't get too sweaty for winter hiking. I really 
concentrate on walking slower. It's getting easier now that I'm in my 60s, but I have to focus on walking slower so that you don't just get too sweaty because then you're going to be sweaty in camp. Everything's just wet. Even if it feels dry, it's a little bit damp. So it's just slow everything down, you know, just slow it down. And uh, I think about canoers. It's like watching Jim Baird doing some of his trips where he's triple portaging. That's a long time. So you just go, I can slow it down. It's what's necessary right now. I want to be a hero. Backpackers, got to charge through. Blah, blah, blah. Just slow it down, killer. So <laughs> we, had, we had changed whatever we were changing into. I don't think I changed all the way out. But I'm wearing my big wool woolly from uh, my Boreal woolly. is this big, heavy, thick, 222-pound piece of wool. It's like a microclimate inside. You, and it doesn't have a zipper in the front. So you have to kind of fight your way through. So I learned on that trip to kind of get in a Zen state, just relax on your way over. Unclench the buttocks, relax. Think the system out. Like I'm going to do my top first, then my bottom or bottom first, then the top. And when you're, you know, you're so cold, you're just trying to fight the cut. Ah! Slow it down. Take it <laughs> off easy. You know, have everything laid out that you're going to put on. And as you take something off, okay, I'm going to be putting this little third shirt back on. I'll lay it here, put everything back on that I'm going to sleep in. I'll put in one thing to keep me warm. And then I do the lower, you know, it's taking, you know, winter camping, you feel like an astronaut. You have all these layers. It's like the hardest thing is get your leg up to get that. I can't get to my boot. You know, yeah. out, hold my leg up for me. So, you know, you have to just kind of take your time, but, um, Think it out, top and bottom. You know, don't try to do both at the same time because then you're going to get cold because you're trying to get it all off and back on. Do your final adjustments and get into the hammock before you're really, really cold. Uh, that's one thing I learned. So every winter trip, I just go, get to a zen place, man. Relax. Don't fight it. Take it off easy. Be loose, but think it out. I think it's really important and overlooked. Yeah. So James, with the, with this whole clothing type of thing, James, you, uh, you said, or you mentioned that you, you, uh, you sleep in your undergear. And yeah. I have your a foot. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. On the other extreme way, I always see Suge. Suge always seems to be wearing, he's got it. He's his, his orange puffer jacket on and you know, it looks well, like I, you're, I, I do add that on. I always, you know, I probably get up to pee two or three times a night. I don't, I don't have a bad bladder. I'm just excited. Uh, <laughs> I, and I, I plan it. So when I get up at four o'clock or whatever it may be, I just go ahead and then I put that jacket on because I'm getting to the end of my sleep cycle and I'm going to want it on when I get up to go grab my food bag and do my morning report on video. So I sort of dress through the night. I will lay it like the last trip. I'll lay it over me backwards if I'm going to read or something like that so I can have an arm out with my jacket on it. And then it's on top of me and it's easy to just peel off and hang it on my ridge line or put it down inside for my second piece. Sometimes I might slip it down inside my top quilt and it feels like putting an ice cube down there. So then it's just sort of down between my legs warming up. So at four or four thirty, I put it on and I'm, I have a layer on for the morning already. So that's, that's what I do with that. It's sort of a progressive, putting things on in the night, but mainly that orange jacket is probably the, the main thing I put on. Mm -hmm. So uh, with that being said, James, you say you're in your undergarments. Yeah. Explain how, so, you can do, how you can do that. Um, how <laughs> you're cold, you do what you need to actually, uh, if I'm not around, it's usually not around somewhere where I can change. So, um, biggest thing right off the bat is, um, speeding it up. So how do you speed it up when you have boots on, right? And you got snow underneath you. So uh, I usually have one of those, a foamy sit pad of some sort. And the first thing I'll do is I'll just say, okay, my feet are going to get a little chilly if I'm standing on something plastic. So I'll put the foam down and usually the foam is good. It won't, it won't melt snow or anything. Right. So I'll stand on it or I'll take off my boots. I'll stand on it. And then from there, usually I do my bottoms first. And really, it's just a matter of, like Shug said, as soon as you're, you're, um, you do your, you sit in your hammock, you can do your, change your socks right off the bat if you're careful, if you're not going to step in the snow. Um, take your bottoms off, put your bottoms on, swear a little bit. And then often uh, I can 
I can change my top inside the hammock. So I'll actually, once everything's sort of, my bottoms are done and I'm sitting on the hammock, just like a chair, right? It's mm -hmm. not too high that I'm, uh, I can't just sort of sit and shimmy stuff um, to get on and off. But, and then I'll take the, the, the sit pad and I'll bang it on something just so if any snow is on it. And then you can, um, that'll usually go into my sled. Usually I'll have a sled or something or on, or on top of my pack that's underneath me. Um, and then when I'm in the hammock, yeah, literally I'll just sort of take off my shirt. I'll put my, uh, you know, or if I'm wearing a base layer, I usually have a kind of the military propylene or whatever they call it, the green. I look like a Grinch when I'm sleeping because it's all green, but uh, then I'll slip that back on. And yeah, I usually do that in the hammock and that's usually not too bad. It's the bottoms, you know, it's just that, just committing yourself almost like uh, when you have to go to the washroom or water tree in the middle of the night. If you, if you sit there for 20 minutes going, oh, it's so cold, it's so cold. It's just like, uh, the worst thing that for me that can happen is I'll start to wake up too much. Then it's hard to get back to sleep. But now I've got myself pretty much trained. Even if I'm not wearing socks, I'll just sort of stand up, go, you know, my feet will be a little wet. I'll shake them off. I'll just put them back in. Usually my, my body just sort of burns. If there's any moisture like that, it'll just sort of burn it off. Um, and then... I find sleeping in the wintertime a lot easier than the other three seasons. Something about being wrapped up with these, and it's not like it's heavy, but these thick layers, uh, the down quilts or whatever you got on. Say you have your puffy jacket, you put it on at three in the morning, reverse or whatever. When you have these layers, um, yeah, it's just so cozy and you just get back in and you just crash out. But, and then, there's also the other question that gets asked, well, what do you do with your, your clothes? Um, well, most of the time I just throw it over the ridge line. Um, jackets or something, you know, it's so easy to throw the light stuff um, back into the hammock somewhere. And hopefully it's not too dark, you have your flashlight if you need to find them because you can lose stuff in your hammock pretty easy. But um, if it's heavy, I don't want to throw it in because it usually gets underneath you. But usually a jacket, a light jacket or something, it'll just sort of toss or everything else pants or whatever goes over the ridge line um and yeah it's just cozy so it's just do it quick be focused don't worry about it just do it quick um, that's, that's the thing rip, rip off the mandate just get it done yeah be focused okay. yeah well, well, i once they, seen a, a tip that you gave shug about uh what to do with your jacket and you say you zip it up around your foot box I do, you know, around the foot of any gear that i'm not wearing if it's just you know a lot of times at night, I will hang like my, uh, I have a pair of Outdoor Research Cirque pants. They're kind of a white, they're, they're what I hike in and wear over everything at camp for the most part. Mm -hmm. Usually at camp, I'm wearing, depending on the temperature, a, a pair of Merino insulated underwear. I have this, it's probably a hundred, you know, grade fleece. Uh, I found them once. They were like sort of cross country skier tights. And I just cut the stirrup out and I put those on. And then my Cirque pants. And that's what I'm normally wearing, you know, uh, at camp. Uh, and, until it gets down to, you know, minus 25 or something, I do have some of those Mont Bell synthetic uh, Thermo Wrap pants that you can just put on over everything. My daughter once said to me, please, Dad, don't ever wear those anywhere <laughs> other than I Please don't, please, for the love of God, don't ever. Please, Father. And she calls me Father. She's serious. Um, well, one thing when James was talking about sitting in the hammock changing, I have um, a lot of times, this is more of a morning thing when I'm changing or putting something back on. I sort of, I kind of pull down my, my pants. I leave my insulated underwear on. And this is if I'm taking off that little thin pair of polar fleece tights or putting them on. Um, and I'm, I kind of got my boots on or whatever. So I'll just sort of pull my first layer and that second layer down to about mid thigh sit in the hammock and then I take one boot off take both of those legs off yeah. take it off put the pants back on that leg and then go to the other leg and repeat you can do the sort of sort of changing system sitting in your hammock even sort of taking your top quilt and throwing it over you a little bit to stay warm and you know keep some heat in and that's pretty effective and that works pretty good you know you Again, you got you're sitting in your hammock, right? I mean, you've got an underquilt underneath you, so it's not like your butt is freezing. No, no, you feel that heat. You sit in there, you're changing, like, okay, the rest of me is going to be warm soon. Yeah, and you still got your your first layer on. You know, it's just a 
kind of a lazy man's way to change. I was thinking about once going, I don't know if this is cool or if it's lame sort of doing it that way, but it, it works. So, you know, I think we all come up with our little, little ways to do thing. You know, none of us do everything the same. If I recommend somebody to sleep a certain way, well, they, like James said, he sleeps barefoot. I know a lot of people that prefer to sleep barefoot and their feet are warmer. I, I tried sleeping in down booties one time and my foot was colder than ever, but other people swear by it. So, you know, we all got our groove out there. We all metabolize differently. And, uh, you know, we can never really tell people that this is the way to do it. This is the only way. You know, you can offer suggestions if somebody asks you uh, in the hammock world. Uh, Rigging and under, you know, under quilts are the hardest part for people in hammocks. I think that's where the heartbreaking part comes in. They realize they got to buy one and then what temperature and is how is a 20 degree going to get me down to minus 10? And, you know, it might be like fishing rods or canoes. Maybe one's not going to be enough. Eventually, you'll probably own two and you can layer them, you know, and stack them and get more, you know, stack up. A, a, 20 degree under quilt with a 40 degree under quilt or a zero degree with a 40 degree or a zero degree with a 20 degree. And that'll get your underside down lower and double up your top quilts, whatever it is you got to do to stay warm out there. If you're going, I'm going to try a zero degree top quilt and it's going to get to minus 30. You're probably going to have a, you could put on more clothes that can work at a certain point. But as I understand it down is catching your heat and holding it, but I've done it you know, where I was really cold and just put everything on and it kind of worked and other times it failed. So I don't know what the, the real answer is. You just got to be open to trying things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I agree too. It's not like I never wear uh, others, but that's what I usually wear. I mean, if I'm pushing the limits of my quilts, I mean, I have some nice fleece pants I'll throw on. Right. And you know, my problem is if I overheat and I'm uncomfortable, then I'll start to sweat. Um, Actually, I guess it's been a couple of weeks now, three, four weeks. It was up at Cold, Cold Lake, Alberta, and it was more of a bushcraft camp. Like we had access to a hot tent with a stove, but we were all in our hammocks out in the cold. And uh, what did we get down to? Minus, I think it was around minus 18. So what's that? That's around zero Fahrenheit-ish, give or take a few, right? And we had one guy who had never slept in his underquilt before. He had just, I had brought it up for him. And uh, so we set his up. Um, uh, my buddy up there, he had already, oh man, he does everything. I mean, with his war bonnet, he has a sheepskin, but he's not a hiker. He's more of a haul stuff in and he teaches bush, bushcraft, right? So, I mean, there's two different, there's different ways of doing stuff, right? But yeah, you know, lots of wool and stuff, but he's got lots of down too. It's just whatever works will work, right? You just have to be open to saying, uh, I'm going to try something else. I'm sitting here freezing. Well, what do you got to lose, right? That's um, true. Yeah, I'll throw some clothes on it. Throw it over top of you. You know, socks don't work for me just because I think it's a circulation thing. Um, they just get they're a little too tight. And I think people find that with their boots. I don't think they realize, like Shug was saying, you know, you got two layers of wool socks stuff in your boots. Sometimes all you need is just one. Yeah, you know, true. Circulation or you don't have, yeah, you just try different things. See what works for you because everybody's different. You need that little. And as you get, as you man. age, things get different. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, when you become an old man, I'm telling you, you know, it's. Uh, I feel things I used to not feel when I was in my 30s and early 40s. Early. Um, <laughs> there it is. <laughs> early. You, know, uh, <laughs> you kind of change, you know, when you're an old man. I hate to say it, you know, it's like I don't really like it, but you have to adapt to it. You know, it's just like okay, I'm I'm Papa out here now. You know, young people coming over going, oh, give me some wisdom, old man. Get out of here, you whippersnapper. Beat it, get it. Uh, all right, come back here, I'll tell you. Uh, that's you That's you saying it now, right? <laughs> <laughs> so so Walkabout uh, Philomots is asking, what, what do you find more effective with the heat reflecting off an underquilt, a single-layer hammock or a double-layer? Are you looking at better heat, uh, or, like, heat retention in a, a single-layer, like a thinner layer versus no, – I've never noticed a difference. I'm a single layer hammock guy. I sleep more comfortably in it in a single layer than I do a double. Some people like that support of a double. But if your underquilt is set up properly, and, and this is where people struggle with underquilts. It was one of the reasons I started doing YouTube stuff was just to try. I need to help those people with their underquilts. I can't drive or fly out there. I don't know where they live. But 
is to get it set up properly. You know, so it's up against you with no gaps. Don't over cinch the end or have the gaps and get it in just the right place. And, you know, it's, it, it can be either very intuitive or it drives people crazy, but when it's, and migrating your down, you know, pushing your down, you know, you can hit your channels and there'd be like, if you had a down jacket and go, I want more down up on my shoulder. You can just kind of shake your sleeve or get your down up there to, to migrate that down where you want it because I've seen people fail with their under quilt. So they, all their down somehow ended up down at one end and it was back behind their back or behind their butt. And it was all like up behind their legs. So that's a really important thing that gets overlooked in under quilts and top quilts. You can kind of snap it and shake it where you want it and pat it, pat it down. There. That's the international symbol for patting down <laughs> or really a really bad karate video. <laughs> He's still saying, woo -hoo! Wait, while you're doing it, right? Pat it. You can reach under there and go, feels a little thin on my butt, so I'm going to pat some there so I have it under my buttocks, uh, which is probably where people feel the cold first before their feet get cold. So uh, it's complicated, very complicated. So this is like you know, that's laying, a, laying on the that's ground really with, your, with, your, with your pad with an R value of uh, – you know, that's, that's good to 45 degrees and you're trying to winter camp on it. You got, I can't believe I was cold. I was on a pad. Yeah. But that pad was not insulating that cold earth. All that cold was coming up into you. So yeah, it's a, it's, you're going to learn winter camp. And if you like it after a couple of trips, you'll really realize if you like it or not, because it is twice the work in general with less of a day. Just Everything is double the effort and double the carry and double the work and double the melting and whether you're, you know, down on the lake and you're busting an ice to get your ice cold water or melting snow. It's just a lot more work dressing more, more stuff. You know, it's like when spring comes, you put your pack on and go, I'm so light. I'm like a fairy, you know, and uh, you don't have all that stuff, you know? Yeah. But you know, we're a little while ago, you were talking about the, the one thing I noticed in winter camping, it's just a lot quieter. You know, there's just, you don't have that morning bird going, go, 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 at 4.30. You know, sometimes when it's so cold and you hear the trees cracking, but you don't hear as much wildlife, some wolves howling or something, but way less birds waking you up in the morning. The whippoorwill's going, I'm out of here, man. I'm going to Florida. Y'all can have these cold woods. So it's just a quieter night, just hearing wind and beautiful sort of silence of the of the snow covered woods there's nothing like it yeah the snow just absorbs all the sound yeah and you know you're talking about under quilts and and the way that uh migrating your down it's a huge thing i mean as huge. someone who builds quilts i do get i get lots of emails saying you know i'm not sure if i've got enough down in my quilt right and it's uh well it's you have to realize you stuff it into a stuff sack you know that your down gets all compressed and it's different parts of that baffle chamber and they'll show me a picture and you can tell that they like a top coat they've shook they've shook it and it's like oh look there's there's some space and space in here with no down it's like well i'll lay it down you know pat it around there should be you know three inches for this given rating and stuff you know where are you at when everything's sort of evened out and they're like oh okay i, I get that they just think it should be stuffed chock full of down and it's you know, that's the nice thing about quilts is you only need a certain amount of loft and your chamber should be done this, the right, you know, filled up just, just enough with a little bit extra to protect, you know, some of that migration. But, you know, migrate your down, you'll have it everywhere. And my big problem is I'll set up my, my stuff and I'll, I'll just throw it up. It looks good. Okay, good. And I'll go chat. I'll go socialize or something. And so it's 11 o'clock. Things are cold. You're in your, you get in your hammock and you're like, oh crap. I didn't really sit in my hammock and make sure that the cords didn't are in the right place. Right. Cause your shock cords with your line locks will come loose. And all of a sudden it's like, yeah, I feel something. And then, you know, it's cold and you're like, okay, maybe I can reach it. You know, you're reaching down, you're doing some gymnastics to get reach the far corner of your under quilt. But oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, <laughs> so it's just like going to the water and water, you know, getting up to go pee at three. You just have to get up and do it. So you get over here. You're like, oh, yeah, cinch, cinch. And then, yeah, winter camping, you just feel you feel things a lot, lot more extreme. 
if you're in the summer and you say you screw up when you're under quilt, you're like, yeah, whatever. Um, for the most part, right? But uh, winter, you can feel things a little bit more. So yeah, it's important to set your gear up and then try it and then walk away and go have some fun. But if you miss that step, it, yeah. I, when I go to hammock hangs, I get so much off my game because I'm talking <laughs> to everybody and I'm running my mouth, telling circus stories, telling lies, uh, trying to, you know, mooch food off people. I'm so hungry. And, and uh, I, you know, I always feel like there should be these required 45 minutes to an hour every day. All right, everybody, go to your hammock, be in your hammock, set it up, and I'll get to my hammock. Same thing. It'll be one in the morning. I'm going, man, I am totally not set up right. You know, I just strung it. and I was down there mouthing off all night. But when I go uh, solo or I go with a couple of my good friends, which is my my favorite, you know, I don't. I don't like to really hike with a lot of people because, well, with Jonah and Alex or Hickory or a few uh, strung out, I haven't camped with him in a while, but you can, you can focus a bit more on um, the moment. And, and on a solo, I think that focus just gets even stronger, particularly when I out in the winter, because, you know, mistakes can be costly out there. You know, you're going to hurt yourself on a fall night or a spring night or a summer night, lay there with a broken leg and, live through the night, but not necessarily in the winter. So I, I just feel like, to me, it feels like when you're driving a boat, you know, you're driving the pontoon, you got people on there, you know, you're driving and got your captain hat on and all right, you're looking cool. You look like you're doing nothing, but you're constantly vigilant looking for, you know, sailboats and jet skiers and the water and the waves. And, you, you know, you're always being vigilant without sort of being obvious about it. And I feel like that's what winter is it's just you know staying tuned in but also being loose enough to enjoy every moment out there every little you know when the snow falls off a tree and goes down the back of your uh, jacket even that is nice it's like ah you know it's like when somebody comes up and blows in your ear oh the, you know it's just it's like the woods are going just just messing with you so it, keeping that fine moment of being ready but also enjoying it it's like i'm out here for pleasure no one made me come uh, this isn't a competition. I don't have anything to prove. I just want to have a, a fun trip out here and and come home happy. Uh, Rich Elliott's asking thoughts on uh, using an underquilt protector for cold weather camping. Who wants I, to take that one? <laughs> you know, it certainly helps. I mean, um, it to me, the underquilt protector more than anything is a wind block. It's the wind can, I think Jim Bear was talking about it on his thing, you know, and that I think he was talking about it when he was uh, doing alone. When that wind hits your sleeping bag, if you're laying out there, particularly your underquilt, and it just robs all that heat that you have stored up in there. It might even blow in between the underquilt and the hammock a little bit, but it's just taking that heat away on real windy nights. And as hammockers, we're under tarps. And I love that because what I love about the woods is waking up and seeing the woods, having access to the woods all the time to be able to see them in the morning. I can look right out and there it is. If you, you want to kind of hang an under quilt, you don't want it tied up against your, I mean, an under quilt protector. You don't want it right up against your under quilt. You actually want a little bit of space. It is sort of catching some warm air, but mine is a breathable one. I don't take it all the time, but it's enough to block the wind. But, you know, you don't want to get condensation in there either. I've never had it too bad, but often there might just be a little bit of ice in, inside on the foot end or something. So by hanging it a little bit looser so you have some space, I think it's a bit more effective. But just to add, at winter, I don't know if it adds any BTUs, but it keeps the wind from robbing your heat that you've built up on a windy night. That's that's my opinion. So, Sean, do you ever notice, um, I like to use an underquilt protector, but... I'm not, I think the problem before I get into that is that everybody's um, area or location is different for winter, right? right. I mean, uh, I look in Ontario and your humidity is usually crazy. Um, you know, when you get the ice, uh, you know, like the frost, right? It's just crazy. So if your humidity is higher, often, you know, things can mess mess up easier and stuff. So, but, um, you know, you, you see people talking about, oh, down in so-and-so, it only gets down to 20 degrees in the winter. Well, I mean, it all depends on your temperature rating, right? I found sometimes in the cold, if um, 
if the condensation or, or such gets on my underquilt, sometimes it'll be just on the inside or on that layer. And then sometimes if I have an underquilt protector, um, like hanging loose, but it's just underneath and it sort of seals the ends a bit for wind, but I'll actually get that, uh, that layer on the inside of the underquilt protector rather than the quilt. Right, that, that's you know? exactly what I see. And I'm, not, and I'm not sure if it's just because you know, the humidity in the air or, or what's all going on, but some nights you'll see it and some nights you won't. And then I, I'm sure it's like that in different areas across the country. But for me, it's easier for me to take my underquilt protector off, give it a shake, the frost falls off of it or whatever. And then I've done it without, and I'll, I'll actually see the moisture, you know, on the inside of the quilt. And I go, well, if I was out here for two or three days, I'd be more concerned about that versus, you know, an overnighter where you just get home and, you know, hang it up or throw, toss it in the dryer on fluff or, or whatever. But yeah, I think it, I, I use one. If I was worried about weight, I guess it all depends on the temperature and stuff that it'd be at. And then I'd know what my quilts are going to be handling. So, so yeah. And underquilt protectors can make it easier for someone who's new with an underquilt, uh, be a little bit more forgiving in the setup. Uh, I think you've talked about that on hammock forms, Chug. Um, it can really kind of help you with your ends so the air doesn't get in ends. as much. It gives you a little, I think it gives you a little buffer on the ends from yeah. getting in. But I've seen people try to use their underquilt protector to pull their underquilt up so tight. Oh. And I feel like you lose your effectiveness there. You know, it's you actually compress your down. Too. Back my pre hammock days when I was really into bivy bag, sleeping bag, I was in my really ultra lightweight phase which I think everybody should go through, you know, doing sit-ups in the middle of the night, being hungry <laughs> all the time. But I would sleep in a bivy bag and I would always have condensation in there. Always. Sleep warm, but I always had moisture. I could never figure that out. But when I slept in my pod even, or a lot of times in winter camping, what I'll do is I, sometimes I use my extra jacket and just pull it over the foot box of my top quilt. Sometimes I put it around the end of my hammock and zip it up. And I'll see in the morning sometimes right where the zipper is at the foot end of the hammock, there'll be a little frost, right? You know, not my head, but right at the end of the hammock where it's just, you know, your, your vapors are just escaping all night. Your moisture is coming out. So that's yeah. why I think it's on the inside of your underquilt protector. And I'll go, oh, that, that is just venting out that little zipper hole right at the end of my hammock. So, you yeah. know, you're really expelling this all night, even though you're, you're burning off heat. Like you can dry things out with your body heat and you know, while, while you're producing yeah. it, right? Sure. And I think that's what happens when you get a super thick quilt. Say, you know, I, I make a pretty, uh, pretty cold weather one. And I think part of the problems is, you know, somebody says, well, is this good for all the time? And I'm like, well, not necessarily. As soon as you start getting super, super cold weather gear, it's, you know, you're gonna be sweating into this. And if it cools off by the time it gets to the outside of the layer, it's gonna freeze inside your quilt. Um, you know, your body can only push so much heat and so much vapor before there's not as much towards the outside. Interesting. So, like, it, it's tough, right? You really have to know your gear. But, well, even people that want to winter camp and they... It's okay. better to have multiple layers and just go for it and then figure yeah, it out. Yeah. yeah. Rather know, than buying the best of the best and the thickest, try the stuff out. Don't feel like you have to buy everything. Just you know, make do, figure it out. And then you'll, you'll know where certain people like to camp under, you know, where it's not super, super cold, you know, you're at zero Fahrenheit, you know, and some people, as soon as it gets past that into that uh, five degree, 10 degree and such, you know, it's, it's not that much fun anymore. And um, yeah, it's, it's just, you'll find, just get out there and do it. Use what you have, bring some old blankets. If you're just hiking a mile in or something, try things out. Um, I think is the biggest thing. Underquilt protectors, you know, they're good. They can be bad, but try them in different ways to see how it works, right? You know, so. it's sort of easing your way in. You know, it's, you know, I understand it when I see a lot of new people. They they get a little bit kind of stuck going, I want an underquilt that's going to take me through the summer and I'd like to camp down to zero someday. Well, that's a lot of range for an underquilt. And it's like you canoers, Dennis. I've one thing I've noticed watching a lot of this canoe stuff lately is people got their whitewater canoes that are talking about their canoes that's good for flat lakes and 
and just fishing and good for whitewater and all these specialized, a 17 foot, a 15 foot, a, a Kevlar, these other materials and old aluminum. You, I, th I don't know. It's probably really hard to find a canoe that will suit all your needs if you're very adventuresome. And it probably is. But if you're going to winter camp and you like it, eventually you're going to have to invest in it. You know, you're yeah. going to have parkas and mucklucks and boots and gloves and different gear for different situations, right? Right. If you're a hammocker and, yeah. you know, if you're a tenter, your little summer tarp may not cut it in winter. I've had luck with my tarp in winter so far, but I choose to do it. Always going, yeah, I could, things could go bad. If it gets really bad, I'll take my saw, I'll go cut some boughs, I'll lean them up all over this thing. I'll do what I have to do, but I don't want to. And I haven't had that situation, yeah. but I'm aware of it. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I'll winter camp the rest of my life because I live in Minnesota. It's a hearty winter here, but I grew up in North Carolina and our scout troop would go in winter and it may get to, we probably got to 28 a few times. We just shivered through the night because the daytime was so fun. You were willing to, we're laying on newspaper back in those days. This is the seventies kids, you know, <laughs> was out there laying what you did. You bring your mom and dad Sunday paper and lay it on the ground and your 50 degree summer bag. <laughs> <laughs> Shivering through the night, but you had so much fun in the day. It was worth it. You know? Yeah. And yeah, it was great. It was you know, me and Hickory in a tent, just teeth clacking, <laughs> you know, that was so good, but it's a lot of fun. And then, you know, there's the subject of the winter hammock sock, an enclosed mm -hmm. sock that goes around your hammock. Now, they don't work for me well. I've tested them in my early days. I've messed with them. I've made my own. Yes, I was warm in there, but everything was damp. And in real cold, I just, it was just covered in ice crystals inside. So the minute you move, all the ice crystals would fall down on me. I had a big vent in the top. I've tried everything. And then I realized, well, warm but wet. But it, for me personally, this is my just my personal groove. I got into hammocks because I like the openness of it. I like being able to see out. Uh, for no other reason, it's just great to open your eyes in the morning and there it is. I don't have to go. Zzz. Other people I talk to, whether it's winter hammocking or just regular hammocking, get to me and go, uh, Shook, I, I feel exposed. I, I'm, I'm nervous in a hammock. I feel like I'm open to everything. And I said, well, that might pass you and you might feel more comfortable zipped in a tent. I mean, try it. If you don't like it, go back to your tent. You can always sell your hammock stuff on eBay or on hammock forums or whatever, if it's good gear. Or you but can I like that openness. <laughs> okay, guys, you know what? We're uh, we're past the eight o'clock hour. I want to uh, we are. the swag giveaway done. And then I put the invitation out there for uh, for anybody who wants to come up on a panel. I see we got a couple of people in the basement. I see you down there. I will get you up. Uh, we'll take a turn and we'll get everybody up. But for anybody that wants to come on panel and maybe ask a question of Sugar James, we'll try to keep it to one question, uh, quick answer, so that we can get everybody through the cycle, everybody get a chance. I've seen a few people pop in and out there. Don't be shy. Come on on and ask us a question. Uh, with that being said, when you do come on, all I ask is that you turn off your YouTube volume, please. Just follow the volume that you have on StreamYard but please shut off your YouTube volume so that we don't get that feedback. Uh, so now we're going to get into the giveaway. Now we've, uh, we've been talking there and Shug and I uh, have a question that, uh, that we're going to put forth to everybody. But first I'm going to show you what we've got. Uh, I'm going to ask you a question. I need you to email me the answer. Please do not put it in the chat over there. I need you to email it to me and you'll have until Saturday to get your answer across. Even if you don't know the answer, you can watch back to find out the answer and it gives everybody the opportunity to actually to, to put in. Uh, tonight for the swag giveaway, I'm going to be given uh, a Canoe Hound Adventures decal pack, a bunch of uh, cool stickers that you could actually put on your water bottle, food barrels, uh, side of your canoe, uh, you know, I don't know, granny's forehead, whatever you want to do. We've also got some uh, Canoe Hound Adventures uh, iron-on patches. Uh, they're high-quality embroidered patches. And one of our uh, our show sponsors or show affiliates, uh, Kid Products, makers of the uh, Kid Twig Stove. You can find them at kidproducts.com. They've got all kinds of neat outdoor gear. But they've given a, uh, a nice ferro rod and striker to, uh, to include in the giveaway tonight. And then I believe Suge has something he wants to give as well. I do. I'd like to come over there and give you a nice warm hug. Oh, baby, bring it. 
<laughs> well, they closed that Canadian border, though. <laughs> um, you know, I got, I'll send something, but I do have a, uh, a sugar patch, um, and it's iron on too. Why you want one, I don't know. I have a little, at the Bird of Bird sticker. Oh, yeah. And I got a little, um, one of my hammock landscape paintings I have in a sticker form, and uh, a little tiny shoe patch. And I've got one for some of those strange people. There's a Maple King sticker of a painting I did. So I would send those or possibly something else. Uh, I won't say what, but you okay. know, um, but definitely I got some swag I'd, I'd like to give cool. out. So, so what we need to do is, like I said, don't put the answer over there. But uh, I'm going to put the answer, or the question up here, and I see, yeah, great. We've got a lot of people in the basement wanting to ask picture or ask questions. So the question is, what was the coldest temperature that Suge has encountered while sleeping in a winter hammock setup? Ooh. You can't answer. You can't win, Suge. I can't get your stuff. Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> uh, please email your answers to coasprize at gmail.com by Saturday at 11 p.m. Uh, once we have all the, I'll, I'll give you a, a reply email to let you know that your answer was correct or wrong and maybe coach you along a bit, but, uh, please do just send your answers over there and, uh, Saturday, well, probably Sunday we'll be doing a drawing. Then I will actually forward Shug your mailing address once I collect that. And then he could send off his portion. I'll send off my portion and everybody's happy. Hopefully have things by Christmas. So I, I love that you have. You make it easy for us C-minus students. I think I know that. I think I know that. <laughs> so I'm going to leave that question going across the bottom so everybody can get the uh, email address. That shirt encountered us. while sleeping in a winter hammock setup. <laughs> Concentrate. <laughs> All good. Okay, so. Uh, there's something else I want to cover a bit, and that is a little bit more about uh, under quilts and how to select a good one. I see a lot of people are asking how to select under quilts, but first we'll bring up Dream because I'm sure he has. Dennis. <laughs> well, we'll just go. That. Dennis Canoehound, a fine guy to go through all this, and just, he's like Mr. Sulu there, just running the show, filing questions. What? Somebody thumped oh. me down twice? Ah, oh, my feelings are hurt. I'm out of here. <laughs> For crying out loud, I had to stop and take my pulse, make sure I didn't die or something. Hey, die. Hey, man. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, Dennis just quit. Man, I got Sorry. mustache envy right now. There's damn internet service. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry about that, guys and girls. That mustache is a survival tool. <laughs> I, I left a comment out there. Oh, no, Shug, don't go bushcraft. I don't need the competition. You know, I got the camo and I got the look. And I'm too lazy. I, I'm the laziest but, bushcrafter. I drag one log in and just go, I'm done. You know, bushcrafting goes with winter camping, though. That's what keeps you warm during daylight. You know, getting out there and bushcrafting and having to hike around, find material to keep moving, you know. I've got, I've got, I got. A thousand questions, but I got one that I really want to ask, and this is for Shug. Um, I don't mean to leave you out, James. That's <laughs> no, all good. It's I, all good. I really don't. I really don't. The I think uh, James. I think it's great. The gear is awesome. Hey, Shug. Okay, you said you're living in St. Paul, and you mentioned Ely. Okay, now my family has been. We go up to Ely annually. Somebody in the family always is there every year two three times throughout the year my family has been going there since 1935 my parents had their honeymoon on burnside lake in 1947 wow now i've only winter camped in boundary waters twice there's to me there's no well look at what's behind me that's 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 what you can expect if you're up in boundary waters winter camping but for all the canoe enthusiasts up there, if you want to still be, in a sense, on the water, Boundary Water is a great place to go winter camping. You can snowshoe, cross-country ski. The terrain is good, especially for cross-country skiing. And get back and winter camp in some of the most beautiful remote area in the world up there. It's awesome. It's beautiful. Right so my question, Shug, is have you winter camp Boundary Waters? I have. And, you know, like I said, this last few weeks, I really ended up watching 
you know, I was, I was telling um, Dennis before the show, about three weeks ago, I was, my wife goes to bed and I kind of sit there and I'll just kind of go to the TV and put YouTube on and different things pop up on the feed. And I clicking through and I ended up clicking on one of Jim Baird's videos and it must've been a part three or something. He was kind of in the woods in this crappy spot and he had to like drag his canoe across this. It was supposed to be a beaver pond, but it was dry. And I'm just loving watching this man just grunt and oh, grunting and farting and so good natured about it. And I, I watched it for hours because I, I liked him because he didn't seem like a know-it-all and he was just showing all the hard stuff. But you can look deep in his soul and know he's loving every minute of it. Um, so that said, um, I, I kind of forget the question. Have I have I camped up there? I have, but for the most part, I've other than me and Hickory, years ago we walked across some lakes to get up to Stairway Portage. Then we camped in the woods. But what I want to do this winter is like a five or seven day trip and walk across the lakes and portages. So yes, a portage. Um, and or, or I was an errand through, and, this, and they just call it a port. We did a port. We did eleven ports today, eleven. Um, and I want to do a route up there. In fact, I'm I'm looking it up right now to get back. And you know, you say, like you say, you're walking across those lakes. But I think the fact that it's winter, that just people talk to me all the time. I go, why would you go? Why would you do that to yourself? And it's like. I don't know. You know, I think any of us that do this stuff have that strange sense of fun. Um, I don't consider myself an adventurer by any means. I'm just a backpacker, um, soon to be canoer, maybe. Um, and it, it's either just down in your primordial being that you like being out there. I've always said, even as a kid, when I played in the woods, man, I felt a sense of peace. Like, you know, all I got to do is not break a leg out here. It's just, we feel peace out there. <laughs> Easiest way to explain it, no matter what your style is, backpacker, bushcrafter, canoer, ultra lighter, ultra heavy, uh, whatever it is, you're feeling that peace out there and you want to be there. And uh, you're right though. You know, the, the ice is starting to freeze up in the boundary waters. It's probably not totally safe yet. A couple of lakes, but uh, there's a couple was ice skating on, um, one of the lakes, there was a video I watched the other night. Uh, he owns a Tuscarora Lodge uh, out there. So soon, so it's a great, it, I think it, I enjoy it better. Um, no, the, I, yeah, that was the thing with Boundary Waters is if you're going up early season, you early. really got to, you got to really watch for any of the connecting waterways between right. the lakes. That's where the, that's where the ice is so ice thin and questionable. But the um, did you hammock camp when you winter camped up there? I did. I you know, I often think you know, I'm going to go out and I'm going to build myself a snow cave or a Quincy or I'm just going to bring a tarp and a stacked wood fire and then I go. No, I'm not. No, no. I want. See, to, I like sleeping in my hammock. I mean, honestly, I go for two reasons. People talk about why they go out into the woods. Mine are probably the lamest of all. I like sleeping in the hammock so I can get 10 or 11 hours of sleep. And I love waking up, having breakfast from the hammock, just <laughs> the hammock, fixing my coffee, just looking out at the woods and go, I have all day and tomorrow and the next day to be out here and just watch the woods wake up. And, and, you know, when you're in the boundary waters, you're just watching the loons or the beaver comes by and gives you a show and a slap, and, you know, a nice pileated woodpecker is just right up there by your, you know, by your hammock and tarp and the chips are falling down, you go, I'm not a super religious man, but I'm a spiritual man. And I go, this is the best show ever. And I'm like, oh, yeah. like the animals are giving you a show because they go, this dude's cool. Give him the show, kids. Give him the show. Loons, do your thing. You know? Yeah. And I, yeah. Let, and I yeah think you're you're 20 home. feet, 20 feet from the shoreline in a hammock and you have a loon come within about two feet of the shore and start calling. And you're rolled up in your hammock and all of a sudden you've got full volume loon in your ears. That's an experience. That's, oh, I, I mean, I, I it's something you'd never forget. No. And I never tire of that. I've laid there. I've got a spot on Moss Lake. I've camped a few times and my hammock is right next to the water. And you know, I didn't grow up as a fisherman or a hunter. My family just, we didn't have that culture. My dad was in the Navy. And we traveled the world. 
and I'm thinking about taking up fishing along with the canoeing so I can just troll. Oh yeah. But why not? I've laid there and just watched the biggest fish swim by and go, I kind of am a fisherman. I'm looking at them. I could just dive in there after it. But that moment of just seeing them and, uh, to me, it's, um, you know, it's just, it's like God's way of throwing you a little gift going, you've been pretty good this week. I'm going to have a fish swim by and you get to see it. Just, just you laying in your hammock, like little Lord Fauntleroy. <laughs> well, I'll wrap this up. I, I just want to say welcome to the retired club there. Shug. <laughs> I got oh. two, I got two years on you. Doesn't look like I only have two years on him, but I, yeah, I'm only two years older than he is. I remember we talked about that last time. You were pretty I new. Think so, I that. think so. And why do I go out and do it? I still have this thing about having to prove I still can, you know. Because <laughs> all these guys go, well, that old bird, he sits at home and watches that stuff on TV. No, so I got to get out there and prove I still can. And, and, I tell my family if I if the day comes that I never come home, just look for a big pine along a lake, and I'll be sitting there, rotting away with a big smile on my face. No so, better place to die. Why be laying in a hospital looking at? Doggone right. I saw the doctor last week, and she says, "You know, a guy at your age, we should be doing cancer screening and this screening and that screen." I said, "I don't want to know none of that." Somebody I ruined my trip one time. This guy was saying, you ever thought about, uh, you're, what if you had a stroke in the woods? And I'm going, why did you lay that in my head? I, I don't want a stroke. Why, did, why, why even bring it up? <laughs> you're out there. Out in the woods. But I know I'd be laying there going, God, I wish I had the camera going. Uh, well, that's it. <laughs> now I always have the GoPros clap, clamped onto my hat running. Dennis knows about that business. I've, And you said, well, as long as you're out there, just take it slow. Don't break a leg or it. That's what happened to me last summer. I broke an ankle out in the woods, getting out of my hammock. Okay. And I had to crawl about 35, 40 feet to get to the where the campfire was at so oh, I could man. have a fire for the night. But, but yeah, be careful out there. Keep the adventures alive, guys. Thanks, it was man. great seeing you all. Good seeing hey. you, man. Yes, I, uh, great stuff, man. Cool. We'll, we'll, Thanks, we'll talk to you all soon. Hey, bye bye. We got a young person over here sitting we there. We do. We do. How are you doing there, lost in the wilderness? Oh, I'm doing. I'm doing pretty good. So you're, I'm you're, lost, you're lost in the bedroom right now, aren't you? I'm lost in the office. Oh, in the office. <laughs> yeah. Um, my sister moved out a bunch of years ago, so when I went to college, I took this place over and I was like, "This is my office now." <laughs> um, so I'm sitting here writing a pa uh, paper about the Adirondacks, and I'm working on my 46 high peaks. And I've always been a tent guy, you know, I've always yeah. loved tents, but I started the high peaks and I was like, I wonder if just making that little switch to a hammock just makes trekking the trekking the high peaks easier. So my question is, is what do you, and you've probably gone over this a million times, and I'm sorry for asking you this question again, but what do you like about hammocks more than, uh, more than a tent? Oh, uh <laughs> Again, to have the lamest answer ever, my last tent trip I was on, I was in my Henry Shires tarp tent on a solo up on the Spear hiking trail. And I, you know, I woke up early, early. It was about five in the morning, like I always did on the ground. And, you know, I was laying there. I always like laying in my bag, having my coffee, laying in my tent. And I kind of had stuff sacks up under my arm and I was trying to drink my coffee and this arm was going dead, you know, and I was just laying there going, it got to be an easier way other than going out and sitting out by the campfire, being in my down and having a cup of coffee. And that sort of led me back to hammocks because I had an old loss in hammock I fooled around with. Now, I, I want to say this about hammocks. And I, I recently did a video about the hammock learning curve, trying to sort of bust some dreams for people because it has a huge learning curve. You know, a tent, you, you look for a good spot, you put it on the ground, you set up your fly, chunk your stuff in done pretty much you know hammocks lead to fiddling so if you're doing peaks you know sometimes you're you have to drop back down to, to tree line or look for where there's trees or get mighty inventive can be done um it what it did for me to be on lost in the wilderness or you know lost in the office it invigorated my backpacking at the time because you know 
being 62 now, this is probably five years. My daughter's 29. And there was like a three year period when she was little, I realized I didn't go backpacking. And I've backpacked all my life since the sixth grade. My dad taking me, being in scouts, going, my dad would go with other scout troops. I'd go along when I was a kid, camping with my buddies in college, drinking liquor in the woods, but always cleaning it up because we were in a good scout troop back in my drinking days. And I, so I realized I hadn't been backpacking. And I said, man, I can't let this go on anymore. Cause you know, another year goes by another year, you end up not going. And I got, I figured I could have a cup of coffee sitting in the hammock and it just reinvigorated my backpacking. You know, it just put a new light on it. I got re-excited about it. And for that alone, I was kind of thankful to it. But then I just enjoyed the sleep. I, I sleep so well in it. I have this consistency of sleep. I, I hope in my sight, I don't push hammocks on people. I'm not trying to. I don't, I don't think they're for everybody. You know, they frustrate some people. But I try to help people that do have hammocks or give them a glimmer of hope. And once in a while, just break their heart going, man, you look seem like you're getting stressed out about your hammock. It should not stress you out. So because the thing is, you got to learn to hang it right. Some people have never hung a tarp. You have your insulation. You're going to start with pads. You got to look for trees. People get really into this. Is 15 feet or 12 or 17 the perfect thing? Going, you're never going to find that. You know, uh, I can be faster than a tenter. And you go, oh, no, you won't be. Oh, no, you won't. Because I've camped many a times, tend to see a flat spot, boom, down, up. Then they come wood, and I'm still walking around looking for the perfect trees because there's stuff growing between them. So, you know, it's not a race. You just do it because you like it. But if you are the kind of guy that likes fiddling with bits, you know, angles and suspension and hanging and tarps and all the little modular bits, then you may enjoy it. Uh, you know, you can get a cheap one on Amazon for 22 bucks that'll come with suspension and everything. Use one of your old tarps or something. Some even come with a tarp and you can try it out with minimal investment. You know, it may not be the best hammock, but it'll be enough to give you the feel for it. If you just want to go low ball and do it, or maybe eventually you'll go to James or little shop of hammocks and decide to upgrade or one of the other vendors, but it's worth a shot. I, I bought a new tent this year. I haven't used it yet uh, because I was going to go out and do the hike in Wall, South Dakota, do this, uh, get the name of this trail. You have to carry all your water. But COVID hit and it got kind of weird and I couldn't really do it. So next year. And I thought it'd be fun to go back out and uh, visit sleeping in a tent, you know, and make it make a good video of me just whining. Man, I only spent nine hours. So, you know, give it a go and, and good luck on all your peaks, you know. Uh, how old are you? Um, I'm 21. Um, oh, great age. Got into it. Actually, I wouldn't have never gotten into this if it weren't for people like you and uh, Joe Robinette, just guys getting out there. Um, so at, after high school, I really got into it. And then I was thinking, you know, the Adirondacks are like right there. So I did, uh, I did this little trail, well, part of a 50 mile trail. and went, yeah, I could really get into this. And then this year, we were supposed to do that that trail and then uh we abandoned the idea and said let's start the high peaks and once we once we started doing that um we made the foolish of mistake of doing one of the hardest ones first so that was not smart but that about halfway up the side of a mountain i was like i wonder if a hammock would make a would make a difference if you had trees you you could but i'll tell you one thing being 21 if you stay in this this hobby and keep backpacking or canoeing or climbing or whatever it is, it just makes your life better. You know, um, you, you'll just always look forward to having a trip. And I think as you get older, even into your forties, you start to appreciate it even more. Uh, you know, it's just, it becomes more to you. It means more. And like what Sty was saying, Hickory and I talk going, I don't know, when we're 85, if we can only go a quarter of a mile, we did a quarter mile in three days. We're going to do it. You know, we're going to get up this morning and walk from here to there. Get ready, pal. Uh, I mean, you're still in the woods. I mean, we've all done this thing where you have a beautiful campsite. You go and hike 18 miles to end up at some lousy campsite. So I don't know. You, you know, I was like this little site that's going, this place is kind of creepy. I, I should have stopped five miles ago where there was this beautiful site. It's not always the distance. It's 
And sometimes you stay in those little weird sites. And at the end of it, you go, that was kind of cool. Once the devil went away. Oh, oh, for sure. I, I, I feel that where you get to a site and it's kind of uh, grungy and you just, you, you don't feel great being in that area, but you know, it's spooky, like, you know, your are already looking. falling over. Uh, cool. So stay at it, man. And good luck with your, your adventures. Thank right. you so much. I really appreciate talking to you guys tonight. Uh, I'm going to uh, hand the ball off to whoever's next. So We've thank you again. Three more in the basement, Darren. We still do want to cover uh, the uh, how to select or what you need to look for. Lost in the Wilderness, thanks for coming up and asking a question. See you, man. Thanks, thanks, come up. Cool. Have a good night. And next on panel here we have Emily. How are you doing, Emily? I'm good. How are you? Oh, hey, living the dream. Look, look at the panel I have on here tonight. <laughs> Pretty awesome. Right? right? <laughs> well, I have a really quick question. I'm hoping um, it's for Shug. Uh, Shug, I was wondering where do you, sure. where you say Shug. You say Shug so good. Oh, thank you. I was wondering where do you get your secret stash of peanut butter pop tarts? I have looked <laughs> everywhere and I can't find them. I, I have been getting them on Amazon, but they're called Gone Nutty now. I mean, I've written letters to that corporation twice going, you know, we old men and some of us don't want Jolly Rancher pop tarts. <laughs> no, we just want a peanut butter pop tart or chocolate peanut butter. I, I can't get them in my local grocery store, but you know, people do send them to me. I'll just get a random box. I never give out my address, but some people know how to cyber find you and a couple boxes of chocolate peanut butter pop tarts will show up. But well, Amazon I'm is lucky because <laughs> I have looked on Amazon and I can't find them. <laughs> Are you in Canada? No, I'm in Wisconsin. Oh, Wisconsin. I don't know. Try, you know, sometimes if you go to the Walmart website, just just Google search, they might have them, but they, they kind of seem to come and go. And, you know, Pop Tarts are just, you know, if I go on long trips, I don't want to carry them because, you know, Pop Tarts get heavy, but <laughs> and they crumble. I don't mind if they crumble and people go, well, you know, you could eat a lot better things. And I go, it's just for me, like when I was a Boy Scout having a Pop-Tart in the morning, it's just nostalgia. And then if you do videos, little things I found that you do, people, if I don't bring Pop-Tarts, people go, how come you don't have any Pop-Tarts? You don't like Pop-Tarts anymore? What happened to Pop-Tarts? You know, you feel this thing like, all right, some of my viewers are kind of into Pop-Tarts. And if I don't eat them, they'll ask why. Um, you know, this, this, talking about this whole winter hammock thing and watching some of Dennis's other videos this past week, you know, this, this thing about filming trips, this YouTube thing creates this, this aura, like people think I know more about hammocks than I know just because I do videos. No, I just do videos because I discovered my camera had it once and it's just kind of a fun way to record your trips. And then it, editing's fun. And I think just because you're on video, people might think you know more than you know, or it makes you an expert. It doesn't. It just means that you film yourself. Uh, I could be saying everything wrong. In fact, I might just start doing that. Uh, just giving all bad info. So <laughs> it, it's been a very interesting social experiment. Um, and I feel like it's a, it's a medium that has to be used carefully you know, this new word influencer. I don't like to think I'm an influencer. I think if anything, I hope I'm just giving people in their 40s and 50s see me and go, well, he backpacks. He doesn't seem that bright. Guy acts like a clown. Um, so maybe I can do it. And I think part of that is just, I, I tried being very, hello, my, my name's Sean. I'm going to show you a few things about hammocks today. And um, I just become a parody of myself. You know, I think the important thing is just to be you, whatever you are. It, there's a Swedish guy, Eric something that does these videos. He does these real quiet videos. And when he talks, I always wait for him to smile and he smiles like an assassin. If he does. And if you're, if, if you're ever watching this, Eric, I mean this in the best of ways, it'll just be like the corner of his mouth goes up. He'll drink his coffee and go. And he has kind of a real calm Swedish way of doing it. And I like that about his videos. Cause you go, that's him, man. You know, he is being who he is. Really nice little video. Sometimes he doesn't talk at all, but was he, when he does, it's in a deep voice. It's very serious. You, you would still as your friend. This is me smiling. And I love that about walking. <laughs> so I feel like what we put out there does, 
influenced, you know, Jim Baird, John and Aaron influenced me this past couple of weeks watching them going, I want to get a canoe and drag it through a beaver pond and carry a blue barrel on my back. That's what I want to do. Canoers have good backpackers. We live, you know, we got to eat crap. Like I hate when a, on a seven day trip going, I got to break my pop tarts up and just have one a morning. It throws off my whole feng shui. So I hope you find them. Just keep looking on Amazon because they, they pop back up. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Right, Before you take off, Emily, who you got there? I keep seeing you turn around looking at somebody in the background there. Oh, my husband is over there. Oh, tell him not to tell him to make an appearance. I've been secretly trying to look for the pop charts for him for Christmas. Right. <laughs> Good luck finding them. Thank you. Bye, Shin. Thanks, Emily. Bye. Okay, so we got two more people in the basement here, and uh, basically we're going to get Carla with a K up here. Oh, Carla. And Hey, and then, uh, we got one more. But before we get to our last one, I just want to do get into the uh, the underquilt selection thing there. So, Carla, how are you tonight? I am well. Dennis, I don't know if my question is for you because I, I do you am I camping? Do I? Yeah. Yes, I do. Okay. <laughs> then, then the question is for you. Uh, I don't think I'll ever sleep in a tent again, to be honest with you. <laughs> oh, you're a big time hammocker. Oh, yeah, I love yeah. you. Okay. So one of the things that I have found is that hammock people like to tinker and we're always like trying new things to, to get our sleep system dialed in. So I want to know from each of you, what new gear or piece of equipment are you eager to to test out and tinker with? Like what's new on your list? I could start with that because I've been talking to James about it. I'm actually, <laughs> I've, I've never hammock camped in the winter. So I'm learning as much as everybody else in the chat over there about winter camping because I'm no expert, okay? Uh, I've cold tented and I've hot tented and things like that. But my, my next big purchase is gonna be a quality underquilt um, and being a Canadian, it's easier for me to buy a Canadian underquilt because of the U.S. Canadian exchange. And that's why, or one of the reasons why I'll be uh, approaching James on this. So, uh, yeah. And I have questions about selecting the right underquilt. So we'll get into that shortly. But I'll pass the Canadian that torch over to James for this one. And then we'll go to Shug. <laughs> me next? Oh, yeah, hey, sure. Uh, well, mine's from a different perspective, I guess. I'm building stuff. Uh, I've... I custom ordered, well, actually everything I I bring in is sort of custom to what I want when I'm building quilts. And since we're talking about under quilts here, actually I've got some, um, I guess, colder weather, extreme winter quilts coming. Or they're on the site, but it's pretty much playing with uh, five five inch baffles with lofts of six and and more inches of, of down and stuff. So that's that's kind of one of the ones I'm kind of playing with. And I, I mean, we were talking about how that affects using something like that. And actually Dennis and I were talking about that. Is that something you want if you want to be able to use that quilt a little bit in warmer weather? But also I've got some, uh, enough people have kind of asked me about uh, under quilt protectors or uh, pop quilt, or sorry, top covers that are insulated, but aren't your typical sock type stuff. So I've got some things coming down and I'm not normally a synthetic insulation uh, person in the sense that uh, I don't normally carry it just because my, where I work here at home, um, my basement is sort of converted over and insulation, uh, but big boxes insulation take up so much room. Well, synthetic insulation takes up even more. So you can't really have both when you don't have a whole lot of storage. So, yeah, it's just playing around with some of this, the synthetic insulations and kicking kids out of the homestead so I have more room to store stuff is great. <laughs> um, Shug? <laughs> you know, I've been messing around. Uh, there's, there's a local guy here named Danny who has this company called uh, Superior Gear Hammock. And he, he reached oh. out to me. And, you know, when you do YouTube stuff, I, I get a lot of people that want to send me gear, you know, and most of it I say no to especially if it's the um, sort of Amazon folks that want to send you uh, battery packs and all this. I, I just don't want to do it because then you feel like oh, they're giving me this. Now I got to have the responsibility of reviewing it. And my policy is always going, if I don't like your product, I'm just not going to review it. I won't bad mouth it. I won't do a bad review on it. I'll just give it to somebody that needs it. But he reached out to me about this. I got one right here. He just made me this. I, just, I was borrowing one. 
And it's a hammock with the built-in under quilt. Um, and this is a um, 15 degree. And you know, because I'm an old guy, an old curmudgeon, <laughs> I don't ever want to like anything new. Yet I have an open mind. But my first impulse is going, I don't want to like it. Probably gonna like it. I don't want to like it. And I've taken it out on a couple of trips and really liked it. It was so weird to get in and keep reaching to adjust an under quilt, but it's built in and it just, it works great. And I've really been enjoying it. It's comfortable. It's been something new that I didn't think I was going to like and taking it on my last uh, two snow trips and have been very impressed with it. I got his 30 degree, he loaned me a 30 degree and I slept down to 18 degrees in it, perfectly warm. And the next night it was 14 degrees and I started to feel a chill come in at about four in the morning. And I carried a little uh, Wilderness Logics 40 degree under quilt with me, jumped out, had it kind of set, put that around it and put my jacket over my foot box and my pad in there and warmed up. But I thought for a 30 degree one to get me comfortably to 18, that was, I was impressed with that. And it's such a weird thing that now I just get in it and I don't reach over to do the under quilt move. And, and I slept in it on the other hand, people go, well, you don't have the options with it. And we were talking about down and how down warms you. So we had a warm spell two or three weeks ago and it was like 75 degrees. And I told my wife, I said, I have to take one for the team here, honey. And I got to go lay in my hammock for two or three hours to see if this 30 degree under quilt makes me too hot. And I brought out, um, a 40 degree top quilt and laid there with my leg out and I never got too hot underneath. So I think the thing you have to do is use less of a top quilt and do like you do in bed when you get hot, you know, you stick your leg out, stick your foot out, but that's been really fun. That's been my kind of my new fun thing that I've enjoyed way more than I thought other than my new grand sports brook. Split. <laughs> Somebody said that you need to get a new sheet for that. So the same thing doesn't happen to you that happened to uh, Jim Baird. I saw that. I did. I, yeah, right yeah. Before I say that. I, was going, I went out and looked at that sheet and went, Oh yeah, I got to get a, see people. I do read the comments over there. So Carla, I have to ask you. So what, what is your tinker thing? What do you like to tinker with while you're out there uh, hammock camping? I am actually tinkering with my clothing. Um, so I've never really invested with good boots and I actually won a contest. So I got these really awesome Baffin boots with the removable liners. I've never had removable liners before and it came with wool socks and base layers and these mittens that I can't, they seem way too warm that I just, I don't think I'll ever be able to wear them because I, I can't imagine it, they're amazing. So I'm, I'm looking to tinker with some of my clothing. So I'm excited for colder weather if it will ever get here to Wisconsin. Oh, another Wisconsin. We have a lot of people here from Wisconsin this evening. Yeah, I had to say that plug. That's like, that's like three three on panel tonight. Yeah, like, go yeah. Wisconsin. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> well, awesome. Thank you, Carly. I appreciate you popping I on. I can't hear anything. What's that? What? <laughs> I thought I'd better look a little more Canadian with my <laughs> beaver pelt hat that my brother-in-law in Alaska uh, gave me one time and my sister-in-law. <laughs> we were talking about those gloves being too hot. This is the hottest hat. I've tried shoveling my driveway in it and sweat just running down my head with this thing. But it's a, it's a super hat. But if I ever... Uh, come to uh, Canada and do some winter camping up there. I'm bringing this hat. Cool. I want to see that thing in person. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Carla. Thank you very much. Uh, have yourself a great evening and uh, hopefully you'll see Carla. the rest of the show. Yeah. And I actually ate the beaver that that hat was made from when we were up in Alaska to, up on their trap line. <laughs> Easy. I'm not a gun guy, but he ended me. We went out to check his trap line and you know, we're on the snow machine driving out there and I'm just feeling like man, I'm, I'm out of Alaska trap line. And David handed me his rifle and he said, let's see if you can uh, hit a bird. So my first mistake was I stepped off the uh, snowmobile trail and I sunk in snow deep. So I just laid that gun right over and there was a, uh, I don't know, it was like a grouse or something in the tree. And I went, boom, and I hit it and killed it. And I'm thinking, grouse for dinner. My heart was broken. He cut it up and used it for bait for some of his other traps. 
you know, like, <laughs> you had a little trap that hung up, like when you catch a lynx, like, you know, a fox will chew its <laughs> leg off and a lynx will come up and you just hang this little trap by a wire. And the lynx is the cat comes up and go, oh, look at that. Look at that little thing and touches it and gets caught by one little finger and just goes, I am so dead and just lays down and dies. I thought that was really interesting. The different personalities of some of these animals where a fox is going to chew its leg off. But that was my one moment of glory as a hunter. And all I shot was bait. <laughs> Kevin, Alan. I oh, shot. Thank you. Uh, does Thanks, my Carla. hat look like a condom? <laughs> no comment. If it was white, right, you'd be a smart. I have to be nice to you when you wrote a nice article and included me in it. So thank you. appreciate that. No Are you problem. really 75? What? Are you really? <laughs> your birthday. What? what? Pop yeah. out. You're like the youngest looking 75 year old guy, but I, yeah. I was watching you on the um, the one I think with John and Aaron. And uh, I know that you're the canoe guy and I'm going to have to get some of your read one of your books because I, I need to uh, I need to learn to paddle solo. Yeah, but that's my question. So uh, am I getting a feeling here tonight? Yes, you You and I are going to take Dennis and James on a canoe trip in Canada. I would love that. You know, I learn really good by going with people that are better than me. And if I go and if I can learn a few techniques and Hickory and I, my buddy Hickory, we um, we rented a canoe one day and we went and paddled around some swamps near Eden to North Carolina. And all we did was go in circles and fight with each other. I want to be the stern man. <laughs> um, and I have been on one canoe trip in the Boundary Waters, and I was just the uh, the stern guy is the guy in the front, right? Or yeah. is that the bowman? That's the bow. Uh, yeah, I was the bow. <laughs> All I had to do was, you know, strung out told me, you don't have to do anything, Shug, but just dig. And and it was really weird because the whole what I loved about the canoe trip the best was the uh, portage because I got to be alone carrying the canoe in the woods. I'm one of these guys, if I'm in the water, I want to be in the woods. And if I'm in the woods looking at the water, I want to be on the water. If I'm at the top of the mountain, I want to be down at the river at the bottom. If I'm at the river, I want to be up at the top. Cool. And I realized I have a lot to learn about canoeing. Um, but I enjoyed the portages. Uh, port I'm sorry, portages. The ports. Yeah. I forgot the my ports. sunglasses and I made some out of some birch bark with these little slits in it. I remember in Boys Life magazine one time when I was a kid, they showed a Native American guy looking out at the wilderness with his fingers like that. So I I didn't realize two things. There's no shade on a lake and that sun really reflects off that water. And, um, and after watching all this canoe stuff these last few weeks, I'm going, I kind of want to take a solo canoe trip. And, but I, I need to practice, you know, I'm a juggler. I mean, I'm, I'm into anything you want to learn, like a hammock, like a computer, like paddling. I know what it takes. It takes getting out and doing it and listening to people that can give you some tips, you know, watching how they swirl that paddle and you know, watching Jim Baird in that white water and where these eddies are. I'm really kind of interested in that. I'm really kind of getting the bug. And I feel like this may sound weird, but get being in my sixties, you know, when you're a backpacker, your whole trip is a portage. It's just <laughs> one big portage you know? <laughs> and you're just carrying. And I look at canoers and even on a double, uh, portage, I'm going, man, they're whipping out such better food and fishing rods and real books and frying pans. And I wouldn't mind doing that. I, I feel like it'd be a, a really great way to see some new wilderness because uh, the one I was on was really great. It was almost a blur. And now I'm really getting interested. It looks like something I really would like to do. And I think I'm going to own a canoe. Okay, that's cool. Oh, there they are right there. I was watching, I've watched several of your videos. Uh, hey, you guys. Uh, God, I love you guys. I, I got so thrilled, John and Aaron down there when they were sleeping in their Amok hammocks. I was going, man, they're in Amoks, laying there separately with the storms going. So, yeah, I'm coming when the time is right and we can cross the borders. I would love to come up there and take a trip with you guys. Totally. I'm in 100%. That's awesome. Uh, James, uh, you, you're in control of organizing all that. Okay, right. I am, eh? Um, okay, he's, okay. He's a uh, Saskatoon, eh? <laughs> yeah. That, <laughs> uh, Shug, uh, uh, two quick questions. Yes, sir. Um, so you do a lot of your uh, videos in the backyard. 
Um, your neighbor, a lot of my how tos. Yeah, your na- your neighbors. Do uh, do they look over the sh- the fence and say what the hell is going on? No, you know, <laughs> my wife and I are circus people, and people go, "What do your neighbors think?" Neighbors get tired of you real quick. You know, I can be doing a video and juggling fire on a roll of bola, playing the mandolin with fire spinning, and my neighbors are out letting their dog poop, going, shooting one of your little movies. <laughs> you know. And they occasionally watch them, but they're so nonplussed by it. It's it's really cool. You know the old saying, you know, familiarity breeds contempt a little bit. Uh, it just rolls off their back. So um, uh, it's, yeah, I like to do the how-tos here at the house. I can control my environment. But a lot of times I'll uh, on a trip, I'll try to shoot a little bit of one, maybe clip it out and put it on something separate. But um, now I just kind of go, I'll just leave it in the clip let it play. And if someone asks, I can send them that video and go at 17 minutes, 11 seconds in. And you can see what I did there. Cause, um, I, I feel like teaching, you know, it's like watching, um, especially John who was just on, he fishes like even when he's tired still at night, he gets out of the tent or hammock and goes and fishes more. And I'm going, what is this fish thing? And I like the non barbed hooks and, uh, and all the little Nick, Nick rookies. I was saying, I was saying that to Meg. Hey, could you cook me a brookie for breakfast? <laughs> could you cook me a brookie? And she was going, "What are you watching at night?" I'm going, "Canadian." <laughs> yeah, I have a lot of I have a lot of Canada envy right now. Yeah, it's great wilderness. Um, people go hard places and take these long ass trips, but the canoe has me really. I never thought it would happen to me. I'm really, I'm really feeling it. That's good. Well, we, 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 we I really, we do. I, I miss a lot of my American friends, uh, um, this whole season. Um, if it wasn't for the Americans, we wouldn't have Quetico, uh, the whole of Bender Waters and Quetico thing. Uh, if it wasn't for Sigurd Olson and Eric, Eric Morris meeting on, on the portage, we, that would never happen. So yeah, we're missing you guys. Uh, okay. Uh, so what is your best and favorite, uh, Halloween character you've had on your video series? Well, I like being Cappy Coleman. I'm doing a painting of him right now back here. Um, Cause I've started, you know, I'm doing some, I've been, since I retired, I've, I've been painting more. I went to school uh, in college as a commercial artist. Um, my first year in university, I studied fine art, but I realized I didn't have any concepts. You know, I, it was a Catholic college and the art class was taught by nuns. And all I did was paint boobs and blood. And I remember going, there's more to life than boobs and blood. And I'm going, there's not, there's not really. And it, it, you know, the one great thing, and I know you're, uh, you teach in college, it gave me the thing that going, I am not conceptual yet. Some of my fellow students are, it's like they've been reborn a few times. I'm just this fresh meat and I need to go out and see the world. So that led me into against everybody's, you know, wishes of becoming a clown with Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey Circus to get out and see the world, go live life, get out there. So all my life until this year, I retired from my act for the last 40 years. I've been an entertainer. So I, I go and fly all over the country. And one reason I love Canada is there's a, there's a company in Toronto on Les Mill road. Um, and they've taught me to not to say Toronto, it's Toronto. And they hire me for their snowbird extravaganza. And I'm the token American and it's the Metapac insurance company. And they come down into the States for Canadians doing their winter snowbird thing in Florida, uh, Texas, and Arizona. And we put on these big shows in these arenas. And I get to know all these famous Canadian acts I've never heard of, but I pretend I've heard of them. And I'm kind of the alternative act. So I've really hung out with Canadians. I know what a twofer is. I've learned so much about hockey. Um, You know, I just love them. I love the Canadian culture. I love the Canadian people. Work hard, play hard, be polite, but they will fight you. <laughs> <laughs> they will tell them, you know, and they'll back you up too. They're very loyal. <laughs> and, and you have the best candy. You got coffee, you <laughs> crunch, you know, you, all the Cadbury stuff is up there. You have ketchup potato chips. Why Americans don't have ketchup potato chips. Seems like something we would have invented, but it was you guys. And now we have poutine here, but Americans fancy it up. We have poutine with with um, mussels and we have some basil going, no, I want Canadian poutine that's just a blob of potatoes and cheese curd and gravy and weighs like 15 pounds when you carry it. 
and, and milk in a bag. <laughs> and what? Milk in a bag. Milk in a bag. Yeah. And and cookies we don't have. I just love to go in the like uh, IJA and go see all the you know different varieties of maple cookies. Matt, get over here. Look at the maple cookies. They're so good. <laughs> And my daughter went to, uh, you know, she went to Circus College at, uh, Ecole, you know, Ecole de Cirque de Quebec and lived in Limalou in uh, Quebec City for four years. So we were going up to Quebec a lot. And then she lived there for five years. So we had that, you know, my daughter speaks fluent Quebecois. Oh, and, that's you know, she just was immersed in it. So we were always going to Quebec. And, you know, I've never gotten to camp in Canada, you know. Oh, so, okay, James, but, James, put, put a stop to it. Yeah. That's what actually you know what we've got one more person in the basement. I'd okay, like to I'm gonna, I'm gonna bail. I'm gonna bail. Last comment is um Shug, uh really it was a great night, but James he just talked way too much. Okay, way too much. much, way too much. I'm trying to keep him from rambling. Oh, he goes on and on. Yeah. <laughs> I lose track, it just goes in wise. I'm but, here. I, I think I'm a token all... Canadian here. Yeah. We're also <laughs> I'm, Canadian. I'm a Niagara boy. Uh Kevin Green Okay, so we got one more person down here, and then I really do want to get into uh, a little bit of uh, hammock select or uh, under quilt selection, hey. things like that. But it's Todd, hot. how are you doing tonight? You just need to turn on your microphone, Todd. All right, I'm all set. Can you hear me? Sure, can yeah. hear you now. How are you doing tonight? All right, this is a question for each one of you. What is the most extraordinary, extraordinary natural experience you've had winter camping? Wait, like, you're in your hammock right now, aren't you? Oh, you got the Eno skylight behind me here for a long time. Okay, that, all right. I, I thought you were lounging in that for a second. Ago. Man, that guy's got it right. I, I'm thinking, like, did you? was it a bear experience? Was it a meteor shower? Was it a blizzard? Was it the, net, the northern lights? What's the most extraordinary thing you've seen while out in the winter? Camping in your hammocks or in your tents? Go ahead, James. I've said too much. You've said too much. Um, there's something. There's something about... When you're when you're kind of all done, and uh, it just seems like winter camping is a little bit more extreme in a way. So when you get through in the morning and and the experience, you're just sort of like there's almost a little bit more of a sense of content there. Um, that that's a huge thing. I think you could get that with a tent or with a hammock. That's just winter camping in general. And you know what? Actually, uh, I was. Oh, the last couple of weeks we went up north a couple of times and and uh, we call it the Disney princess effect. It's amazing how animals are a lot more uh, content to be to be around you. So I actually got pictures of me holding up my hand and these gray jays are landing, you know, expecting food. And I don't know if I, yeah, maybe I gave him a pretzel or whatever. But but actually, I, I had never done that before. I'd seen pictures of chickadees and stuff, but honestly, that was amazing. He just perched on there, and he actually his little talons just gripped on. And I was like, "Okay, I'll, I'll bear it. I'll bear it." But it was really amazing. And we had this fox. Uh, I guess it was a couple of weeks ago. Came right through our camp, and he, I. It was just amazing. We just watched. It. I was like, my wife called my wife. Come on over, come check us out. And you know, it was it was just. Sometimes the wildlife experiences are are amazing. Uh, I'm not I'm not too worried about bears or anything like that. You know, you just sort of respect it and and you let it happen, right? And yeah, just just that interaction that for me, yeah, Disney princess effect, you know, whatever. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. Yeah, because yeah, we see uh, Snow White out there, you know, with all deer and stuff, and yeah, we actually saw a an elk, you know, what was it? Probably about thirty feet from us, and. Just the area we're in, you know, there's no hunting. It's a national park and stuff, but it's just, yeah, it's, it's amazing. Uh, yeah, everything's so quiet. You see these animals around you, and it's just you. Yeah. Sorry, we're rambling, but yeah. How about yourself, Shug? Well, it, you know, it feels like you've been gifted. One, winter camping was six, seven years ago. I was in Finland, Minnesota. It's a town I go to. Superior Hiking Trail runs through it. I just like the lay of the woods there. You know, it's like when I see you Canadian guys, many of you seem to go back to the same places a lot of us do. Like, you want to go revisit it? And I can get to Finland in about four hours. And I'd hiked out, and where I was camping, there was just wolf tracks everywhere. And so I kind of have this um, 
hippy dippy vibe that I tell people that ask me if I'm worried about animals. I go, you know, I go into the woods without a chip on my shoulder. I go out like, hey man, I'm in your, I'm walking through your neighborhood. It's like when I lived in New York City. Don't be cocky, but don't walk scared. You know, if you feel like something's happening ahead of you, just cross the street and go the other way. Don't be a hero. So I'm laying in my hammock that night, wolf tracks everywhere, probably about 7.30, and I hear a pack of wolves, and it's like they're singing bluegrass, and they're kind of coming from this way. And then another one back here, and another pack there. And there's like four packs, and they create that bluegrass-type discordant harmony where coyotes sound like drunk teenagers who, you know, <laughs> who are just trying to sing and they don't have it. But wolves have this great blend. I was kind of laying there for a minute thinking, well, there's – never deaths by wolf really very rare and you know and as i was uh, telling some of my family about it they go weren't you scared and i go no you, you have to succumb to it i'm laying in my hammock so what am i going to do pack up and leave you lay there and accept it and go i'm getting this concert man um in the woods laying here in the hammock in the dark by myself that was pretty fantastic but you mentioned northern lights and we have a we have a park here called Voyagers National Park, and it's more of a boat park. And my wife's uncle had an island there for years. Uh, the government's now taking it back, but he had like had it for 20 years. This old lady left it to him because he shoveled her driveway every time in the winter and her own kids wouldn't do it. I've seen the northern lights there three times over my years camping. It's pre-hammock days. And it always started where they be looking north, crossing the woods at the horizon of the trees, See these little green lights just kind of stretching up. Like it's almost like somebody's out in the woods shining a kind of a Hulk, the amazing, you know, the incredible Hulk green up into the air, going up in a cone. They'll kind of go back down. And then they're kind of just starting to go up and down. And I'm watching that going, what, what is that? And then they just started stretching out. And then the show was on. And it was just my brother-in-law and out there once, and my wife and and my wife's sister had gone home and we we got a show that we laid there and watched for three hours it was behind us it was above us it was over there there were swirls i finally saw the red ripple it made me nauseous after a while i had to walk away from it i'm going i, I can't take it anymore it's just too too much so i've had that experience though that was late fall and then the, uh, just one other weird experience it was in winter was coming face to face with a timber wolf on the trail i actually got it on video and he was crossing the river all clumsy, slipping on the rocks. And I was just getting ready to go down and get water. And I got my camera and I'm walking down, went, it's a wolf in the water. And I knew it was going to happen because it happened to me before, but I didn't film it. It was going to see me and run. And then he kind of saw me and you can see his head go. And he just, as graceful as ever, ran back across that river. And I like to think he was going, man, dude caught me all clumsy and, <laughs> you know, like, you know, it's like nobody's watching you and you're dropping stuff. And he was just slipping on rocks. But, boy, he ran out the other way. And those feel like moments. And we, we all get them. I know everybody gets one backpack. And if you go in a – even if it's a, one of my weirdest adventures, I set up my hammock at night one time in this place and set up. And I'm kind of laying up in there reading. And I'm just hearing this. Kind of go, what is that? And I finally – you know, put my headlamp on and look down there, and I I pitched my hammock in a, some clover, and there were like 40 rabbits under my tarp. I mean, still <laughs> here, regular rabbits, you know, thumper. There was, it was creepy. That was the creepiest thing I ever had, all these rabbits just sitting there going, <laughs> you know, and making friends with chipmunks and red squirrels that come right up to me. It's just like, I feel like the animals will... I, I don't know. I, it sounds weird to say. I don't even like to say it, but I feel they know you're cool and they're going to go, let's show ourselves. Let's that Disney moment. Let's go show ourselves yeah. with this guy. You know, he seems cool. Maybe we'll get a peanut out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, I did all those moments together. Um, just, just great moments in the woods. It's make going out there when people go, is it fun? And I go, I don't know if fun's the word. Backpacking. It's beyond fun. It's not fun. It's hard. It's, it's everything, but you know, for me, it's like a Billy Jack moment. You know, it's like when Billy Jack would eat the peyote and go out there and dance and feed his soul. I, I think because I'm not a hunter and I'm not a fisherman and I'm a circus clown and I'm an entertainer, I kind of sometimes need something to do that. This is my sort of—I uh, know this doesn't sound right in this this culture. This is my manly thing to do. 
And it comes from scouts and just finding that piece out there. And I come back going, all right, I did that. I can do that. That's pretty easy for me, whether it's a longer trip or a shorter trip. We all have that feeling when we come home. We only tell the bad stories and all anybody wants to know if you saw a bear. They don't care about uh, how many grams is your cook pot? You know, what is your pack way? Uh, what is your canoe made of? Do you use yolks? Do you just drag it? You know, so I think that's why we can all bond as this little tribe, no matter what our groove is on camping. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I, I could tell a quick one too there. And like, like I said, I don't have the winter camping experience in a hammock, but uh, through my summer experiences, probably one of the coolest thing is being, being in my crew of the people that I, I canoe with usually, I'm usually one of the only guys that has a hammock. So I get to have some really unique hangs. And that, that's, uh, that's the thing I kind of really enjoy, the time that I, I actually hung over probably a 20-foot cliff on a shoreline, right? Uh, just brush and sand down below. But uh, the time that, you know, I had to hang over a sharp, pointy rock, but probably the best hang I ever did have was on a shoreline. And in the evening there, we had a thunder thunderhead coming in, but it was really low and it had a big buffer above it and got to see the northern lights, a lightning show, and heard the wolves howling all at the same time. Oh, that's intense. And it, it was yeah. like it was like one of those epic moments. I could tell you the lake, Sisney Lake up uh, northern Ontario. And it was uh it was just a phenomenal thing. Now, mind you, the northern lights weren't vibrant like you probably get up in minnesota or maybe up around uh saskatchewan i haven't seen them in years but no but uh through. it was it was still uh you know an ontario rendition of it and it was uh probably one of the most magical nights i ever had in a hammock was just laying there and watching this right well the thing is we if we don't go out there we don't see it you know you're not going to see it in the cities you know I, I can go to a play or a concert or i like to go hear classical music and it's a wall of sound that vibrates through my loins and it's wonderful, but to be out in the woods, you know, I even hate day hiking because I'm out there sometimes, but what am I out here for if I'm not gonna sleep here? I want the whole, it's the sleeping out there and being out there and, and that, that moment happens. You know, even when you're talking about camping in the snow a little while ago, those nights when you go, you crawl in to go to sleep, whether it's your tent or your hammock and it's pitch black and then suddenly the moon pops out it's a big moon and you're wondering if again is somebody shining a spotlight out here and that moon is just yeah. bouncing off that snow across that lake and it's so bright and i always go out and pee on my foot because i'm too busy looking up at the sky <laughs> and uh is that too much information <laughs> no it's fine yeah it's all good but the wolf sock you know you're still warm you're still warm still warm <laughs> Awesome. Thanks, Todd. I appreciate you popping on panel and uh, asking a question. All right, Todd. Thanks, See you guys. Later. Have a great night. Okay, guys. So we're, uh, we are into overtime officially. It's 9.15, and I really do want to uh, get a little bit of uh, information off of uh, James here regarding what should somebody who is shopping for a underquilt, because an underquilt is probably one of the most important things when you're actually winter hammock camping, what should somebody be looking for as a first-time buyer? Um, what should they stay away from, and what should they be looking for? Um, do you want all those answered at once, or can I? Well, you know, I just tell a story, man. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, if you're looking for, well, here, let's take you for instance. Do you have an underquilt already? I do not have an underquilt already. Okay. Oh. I know it's kind of kind of bizarre. Um, well, the nice thing about an underquilt is for the most part, like Shug had men mentioned before, with down, it, it does breathe a bit. So well, it breathes a lot and you can get a warmer quilt and still use it into the summer. It gets a little harder when you have a super warm, you know, a, a really sub winter style quilt. And I know in Saskatchewan, it doesn't get super, super warm like it does in some other areas and it's harder to vent them. But you know, if you want one quilt to do it all, then you could probably go with, uh, you know, uh, look at the temperature ranges you're going to work at. You know, if you're going to be doing minus 17, 18 Celsius, which is zero Fahrenheit, then, you know, that might be the way to go. And then you can use that into the summer, right? Mm -hmm. And you have to realize that as soon as you get into down quilts, they get pretty expensive and no one, it's like canoes, you know, how many canoes do you have? Well, I shouldn't say that because I'm sure 
I know a lot of people who have like five or six, but yeah, does anyone just have one canoe? Yeah. Okay. You know, right. <laughs> you talk to people, oh, I need one for whitewater rafting. But no, 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 no. It's got to be a tripping one. So it can't just be a 15 foot. No, it's got to be a 17. No, that's not big enough. But it's got to be Kevlar, but then I can't use it on the rapids. It's the same with underquotes, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you're just going to have one, try to pick something that's in the middle and you can always supplement it. Mm -hmm. um, another big thing I hear is do I want synthetic or do I want down? And, you know, I think a, down gets a bad rap when you when you talk to people who are on the coast or high humidity uh, or where it's going to rain. Down quilts are pretty resilient. You know, you have to do something really silly to to make a down quilt not work for you at all. Right. So we've had people do the West Coast Trail in the rain using down quilts and top quilts and, and under quilts and not have any issues. Uh, you know, so that works too. Some people will want a synthetic quilt for that and, and it makes them, you know, they feel like it might work better for them. But the, the, the pitfalls with that is if you're a hiker uh, carrying synthetic quilts, um, not so much the weight, but sometimes it's the bulk um, carrying those quilts. I mean, it takes up a lot of your, your pack and down comp compresses so well, you know, if, if you're, if you want to go ultralight, it also means you're using a pack that isn't too big. So down's kind of the way to go. Um, and then your budget, right? Uh, duck down is, can, does the job just as well as goose, but you can't get the higher loft, uh, down. And, you know, so there's, you know, there's some pluses and minuses to everything. I tell people though, if, if you're on a budget, right, you're partial as opposed to full length, you know, you're yeah, yeah. Kind of saving some money on a partial, but you have to sort of work with your yeah. foot area a little bit. So, you know, and that, that's a whole different uh, bag of cats, that one. Um, if you're just starting out, I know a lot of people want to say, well, how about a partial quote? I've seen Chug, Chug, I've seen Chug, you know, he uses that uh, really short thing. And you know what? they work but you have to be willing to work with it because right. for instance me my first quilt was a mount washington three no 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 graylock three there we go graylock three and i could not make uh, a pad underneath uh my calves work because i move around too much i'm a i, I shift so i go so on my side i go on my right side i'll go fetal and that pad will get lost and yeah i just couldn't make it work so i mean you have to look at it um your first quilt it's hard to go right into a partial if you're if you move around a lot i'm just confusing the issue aren't i look at no, your budget no, no. It, it's complex yeah there, there's so much to it all right uh like yeah. you're, you seem surprised that i don't have an under quilt while well, summertime i always use uh just an insulated pad inside of my my hammock and oh. i've been doing that for years now right but now that i want to dabble in the winter camping uh aspect and backcountry camping with a hammock this is why i obviously but i want to invest in a proper type of under quilt right one that's going to yeah. carry me for the cold weather now if i go to algonquin like uh algonquin provincial park weather you know we can get nights that can go down to minus 25 celsius there right yeah. so i want something that's obviously going to get you there Oh, he's frozen up. Sorry, yeah, my my internet is freezing right. Now. <laughs> you were so good. Yeah, better when you have to keep it, all, it only happens when you talk. <laughs> I can't believe he doesn't have an underquill. I mean, I'm surprised. Out there laying on a pad, although you know, like the Amok hammock is dependent on a pad, and I really like that hammock because it's easy to go to ground if you but, have to go to ground. But it also holds it in place though, right? It, it if does. You're gathered it, in, you know, and, and I, if you move around a lot, it's hard to stay on that pad at times. And it doesn't, uh, where it comes up around the sides, you know, of an under quilt, you'll get some uh, insulation around the corner, around, around the edges. Go off. I do like the chair mode, but uh, it's, you know, it's, I guess in all this stuff, there's, you know, people, when the people ask me, they want the perfect system. I go, I don't think there's a perfect system. You know, you're going to have to perfect what you get as much as you can. But the perfection is just being out there. We're always tweaking and it's just a given in hammocks, isn't it? It's like, yeah, the one thing you get through all your hammock learning. I didn't trust my underquilt. I made my first one. I still used the pad with it because I, I just didn't want to trust it. And I finally went on a trip, didn't bring my pad and used it, went, 
what have I, oh my God, this is yeah. so nice. But I didn't know, you know, I had slept in a pad for a year and a half and these underquilts are like, what are these underquilts? I mean, it makes sense. So I kind of filled my hammock with firewood to about my weight, went under there and put some material on and made darts to make sure I knew it'd be up against me. And I still use Franken quilt all the time. It's a partial I made. And, yeah. and then when I finally used it, I went, oh, it's giving me back all the comfort I want. Yeah. And I think people don't understand quite uh, how down works, right? They just think it's this magical insulation, but it really relies on your body heat. And I, I noticed with, I'm looking over at the, the questions here. Um, when you stick a pad in between you and your underquilt, I mean, you're not really putting your heat into that underquilt. Like it's not you're doing not. what it should be doing. And it was almost you know, is that really boosting your quilt? Not really. You know, you're, you're not really making, letting it work. You know, and it's tough because uh, if you have another underquilt, you can easily stack them. And, you know, once you get the knack of that, it, it works, right? Um, but when you try sticking stuff that becomes a vapor barrier on the inside, um, somebody else had asked a question a while back, can I stick an emergency blanket? You know, when it was reflective. And I'm like, I'm thinking, okay, you could, but really that if you're in a pinch, you'd be better off putting it around you maybe. Uh, but you know, you're not really putting your heat into that underquilt. I tried all that stuff and I would wake up warm, but moist. Yeah. And I did a video maybe two or three months ago about in the backyard, just because I didn't want to take it camping, just because I get to question a lot. I did a light underquilt with a pad, a very light pad and slept the night beyond the range of the pad, beyond the range of the underquilt. And I slept really warm. And I'm, I still don't know if it was the pad that was giving me more warmth it's maybe just a little bit of it's how I it's how I help people gather wood. I'd help you, but I'm filming. Yeah. <laughs> I picked up a little bundle of twig and I drop them off. Look what I did. So yeah. I don't know if that was the underquilt's job. It just mathematically and scientifically, I couldn't figure it out. But some of it is kind of psychological. Um so I think you know, people and, get and, and we're not saying that pads are cold you know those blue foamy pads are the best things in a, in, in a hammock because they're flexible and they they can fold around you as mm -hmm. as you know opposed to uh an inflatable i'm not talking an aim an amic hammock but uh, you know i mean they keep you warm on the ground i mean they do their job but if you have if you have a you know an under quilt um you know you just gotta kind of make it you have to have a, an under quilt that works for what you want. And then you, I guess you find different ways of making it uh, extend further or you buy another one and you can either stack it or a little bit more specialized. Right. But when you're first starting out, I asked that question about stacking and I did a video on it and they were going, does it compress? And it's kind of like, you know, down always like if you put on a light, like my orange down jacket, I always wear, it's more of a sweater and I put my other down jacket or something on top. Sure, it compresses it a little bit, but I'm still warm. But if you put a second underquilt on, you just have to loosen your suspension enough that it's up against, but not just <laughs> mashing it. So it takes just a little, let it out just a little bit. When you lay in there, you can kind of tell. So I, I imagine you'll always have a little compression. It's like yeah. all of us laying on our sleeping bags. The back is down, but we're on a pad, so we lose a lot of it. But it still kind of helps, you know. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. like and your top quilt under your legs in the hammock, even though you got an under quilt. It feels like there's a little extra, um, but it's a the under quilts are the. I feel like when people get to those beyond the expense and the the craziness of, of setting them up right, I feel that's where that breaks some people getting into hammocks. They've gone through all yeah. this learning curve and they get there and they're just like, ah, ah, ah! you know, they just swing <laughs> it all the way and run. And I, I don't blame them, you know, I, I don't. It, and th there is a learning curve with underquilts. I mean, I think people are so used to just setting something up, hitting a button and everything aligns, right? Right. Um, underquilts, you know, there's a knack to them. Uh, I, I went on a, I do this boreal trail in Meadow Lake Park where we are, and it's just sort of my primer for spring. And in Saskatoon, I, Saskatchewan? I, yeah, it's in Saskatchewan. You betcha. How, you got it, right? how, do, you get that? how do you get Saskatchewan? Catch your one, Saskatoon, Sas. Sorry, that's all good. <laughs> Actually, that's why I came on is to see you. Uh, it's an acronym. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but you know, night two, I totally screwed up my underquilt, and you know, for me to tell somebody, hey, yeah, 
you know, I make these things, this is mine, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I totally screwed it up. Um, I slept cold. So my quilts, I just try to, if it's a, a 30 degree, I'm good at 30. I know I'm good at 30. I'm good for a few more than that. But yeah, I totally screwed it up. And I'll admit to it. Yeah, I just set it up wrong. I adjusted things wrong. Down was compressed. Mistakes were made. And, you know, even the best of us just sort of oops. And then the next day, you know, my next setup, I just loosened everything out, redid it again, and I was fine. You know, so we had a, I guess it would have been around a 25, and then I was toasted the next day, right, or the next night. Um, so it's not as easy at times. Sometimes, you know, things happen. So the more you use it, the more you'll figure it out and you'll figure yeah. out the nuances. But back to what your original question was, what do you pick? I mean, if you this is your first quilt and you want to kind of encompass a, a wide range of temperatures, you know, get a warmer quilt. And uh, I know you were looking at that minus 25, which would have been, what is it, a 10 or a 12 Fahrenheit. Um, that is going to be harder for you to vent once we get into um, warmer, warmer ten temperatures. Just because you have dual draft collars, you have things that makes it tougher for the, for the air to come in and cool you off. That's why I was sort of, you know, that's why we're talking really, right? You know, just make sure you get the right thing. I, I did so, a video venting under quilts and you know one of the easiest ways you know slide it to the side and then when you get yeah. cold, bring it back around put a shoe in it or one other piece oh. of your just to pull it down and then when you start to feel cold at two in the morning just chunk that out but that could be done you know it's easier to vent than it is to hmm. add and get warmer unless you're going to layer a quilt or throw a pad yeah. in or put it under a quilt protector or wool blanket or sheepskin and on and on and on and infinitum yeah, like it's. What, yeah, what, I mean, it's just something you have to like, think like about. Like you're you're mentioning that okay, like you know you got uh, partial under quilts. Yeah. <clears throat> I can't make them work. Shug does. Am I pronouncing that right? By the way, Shug. Shug. It's a shush. I like to be the shush, but people call me Shug. Um, no, it's Shug. Sure. Uh, partials. I made a partial first, but as a backpacker. You know, backpackers are always looking for real estate. What takes up less room in the pack? Yeah. And so for me to have that thing come to sort of the uh, just almost to the top of the back of my knees, whatever that part of the leg is called. I call it the sexy part um, and have that and then have my top quilt. And then I al almost always use a little Thermarest sit pad inside my top quilt under my feet all the time because it kind of just pads my old circus my old man feet, my my heels have had a lot of injuries from jumping over elephants in my circus days and just being a juggler and a unicyclist. But the pad wore me, but I never really got cold at that little area between mid calf and right that little area right above the back of your knee. Did that call the sexy part? Um, I never really felt the cold there much. And if I did, I just slipped my little piece of reflectix I always carry up under there. And I just that's just was my first under quilt and I just kind of learned to work with it. Yeah. Um, and once I went with my first full length, I went, oh. started for winter camping going down around your feet. You know, I, you know, winter camping, it's not so much like when people ask me, people love to ask you, what is your pack weigh going? I don't even want to know winter camping. It's, it's more than the other seasons, but it's, it's more bulk with jackets, white gas stove, carrying fuel, you know, just winter stuff, more gloves, more insulation. Um, you have a few more options just, just in case you need, need to be a little bit warmer, really. Yeah. And, and like you said, the stoves are different. Someone asked you about your, your, your stove actually earlier in the winter and it's just, you know, when it's, I, I was following this and it's just, uh, yeah, like your stoves are different just because when it's that cold out, you know, uh, a gas or a liquid gas stove just works better than a, a canister stove. It's just when things. You're no, that that whisper yeah. for me. But you know, if I pull a pulk, like I tell people, it's not like pulling a pulk is a piece of cake. You know, you're no. breaking the trail on your snowshoes. Uh, you don't have that weight on your back. But you know, I, I kind of learned a thing from watching people do the portage. Where years ago, where I go, I'm at a big hill and I got to pull this pulk up a big hill on a trail. You know, learns and stuff. Just drop pulk, 
walk the trail up, come back down, get my poke, and now I've got a path. And it's worth that little effort. And then I can just sail right up with the pull. But I go, people think you can add 10 times the weight in a pull going, you still got to pull it. You know, cross a flat lake, it's not, it's not, there's some effort to it. But when you're back on a trail in the woods, you got to make these turns and you got the, the downs, there's times, you know, you got to put the pull in front of you and let it down. It, it's not quite as simple as it seems. And I, I need to show that more on videos um, because earlier when you were earlier, uh, you were talking about you messed up your underquilt. We all fail out there. You yeah. know, we all fail in our adventures and our trips and our setups and our cooking and our thoughts and our weather predictions and everything. And there, there's no way, you know, if, we're, we're, if we get a perfect trip, it's, it's not that it's boring. It's crazy. But I think we always learn by the failures we have. And then you're aware of, of that failure. Getting off yeah. trail. Don't panic. You know, just backtrack, you know, a million, a million, million things. So failures are good, even with someone that sells under quilts. If it messes up for you once in a while, well, you yeah. can relate that to your customer who's probably going to fail with theirs. And you kind of know their experience, I think. And it also keeps you on your toes. I mean, you're thinking, OK, well, OK, this happened. You know, what can I do? What can I change? You're always evolving your, you know, your gear. Right. Um, now, this is a winter story, even though it happened late fall. So I'm in the Prairie Province, right? Saskatchewan. You're good at uh, I went over to meet with two other guys that I hadn't met before, but online and um, one's out of Calgary, one out of Edmonton, good hikers. And we met uh, in the Rockies and our, this was, I guess in October. So the larches were changing. I think our expected uh, low was minus six, which is what, just a little warmer than 20 Fahrenheit. So we, we got to, and this is in the mountains. So we got there, we started hiking in and stuff and we're wearing our, our trail runners, honest to God, trail runners. We're thinking, okay, no problem. And we know what our lows are supposed to be and you give it, you, 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 you try to work with it, right? So then we started hiking and then it was like, okay, that's, oh, this is awesome. And we get going and, and it's all elevation and all of a sudden we're in snow. And uh, I'm thinking, no, oh, trail runners are going to suck here because my feet are getting soaked, right? And it's just an overnighter. So <laughs> we're two thirds of the way up. We're in snow. All of a sudden, we're sort of, we're not quite post holing, but it's deep, right? And we're breaking trail and snow's falling on us off the evergreen trees. And then we hike up to this little bowl and it's frozen and there's no firewood. Uh, it's, it's a camping spot where a lot of people have cut probably live wood just to keep a fire going. So we're up there and temperatures are dropping and yeah, it, it, there's snow. So I'm up there going, okay, we all have 20 degree under quilts and uh, you know, what are we gonna do here? And we're like, okay, well, let's get a fire going. We had literally hauled steak and potatoes up this hill and or this mountain we set up our, our quilts our tarps uh, one guy was using a new under quilt 20 degree actually was one of mine and his tarp all running hexes and all of a sudden this we're up there and this this bowl becomes a major the storm breaks through and it becomes a literal toilet bowl of wind i don't even want to know what the wind was doing but we it was so loud it was so cold i think it dropped below zero fahrenheit it was around that. And then you had wind chill on that. And, uh, you know, it's a really humbling thing, right? Although the guy that I brought the underquilt for, he was really impressed because it was quite warm. But I just remember getting in there. I had, for some reason, I had fleece pants. So I'd put them on, an extra, my down coat. You know, I'd put it on in my hammock. See, I don't always wear just a base layer. But, you know, and we got some sleep. And me as a, you know, I make, make gear. And I'm still in a situation where I'm unfamiliar with, right? And these other two guys, one was ex-military, a uh, good hiker. And the other guy done a lot of hiking in the Rockies. We, we did find some wood, got a fire going, and, I, and we're eating, and my feet are freezing because, you know, you stop moving. You're wearing trail runners in the snow. And I say to him, I say, you know what? I'm a little worried here. What do I do? You know, um, and the one guy he goes to me, he goes, you know what? Let's heat up some water water bottle don't worry just take the cold stuff off your feet don't worry put the water bottle by your feet and let's see you know see what happens and it was just just having somebody go yeah slow down just chill out your gear 
uh, we'll see how it goes. And, uh, and being the gear guy, I mean, I knew more about my own gear and the gear that they were using, but the circumstances can still catch you where you've never been before. And this happened to me canoeing too. Something else. That's a different story. But yeah, it's really humbling. You know, nature just goes, hey, screw you. And you're going to learn something today. And uh, yeah, I tell you, the water bottle, just being able to calm down. Somebody else said, hey, don't panic. All of a sudden you're like, okay, that's good. Somebody else is being that guy, right? Yeah. And then what a night. It's one of those nights you don't get any sleep. The toilet bowl, wind. I think they said it was around 80K winds. So what's that, around 40 miles an hour? That's a, that's good. Yeah, that's. Yeah. So at around 4.30 in the morning, it was all of a sudden, it was like, all right, anybody else sleeping? Nope. All right, let's just start packing up gear. <laughs> and, you know, you just pack up and then you're, you know, I, I put seal nylon stuff sacks over my feet, you know, to put into the shoes. And oh, yeah. Yeah, it was just, you just sort of made do. And you just have to realize when you're out there with your gear, you just sort of have to, you, you, I don't know, where did I go with this? I, I'm rambling. It was I a great story. Be, no. This is a winter <laughs> story. This happens. You have to be put in there. Uh, yeah. But you learn about your gear, right? And how to, you know, it's just, yeah. Where did the story start? <laughs> uh, yeah, we were talking about hammocks. Sorry, sorry I kept breaking yeah. up there, guys. I even ducked out there to see if I could get my internet to come in better oh. like popping open back in. But anyways, you know what? We are uh, 938. Uh, going to try and pack it in here for the evening. Um hmm. Dennis, let me ask you something. Sure. Do you ever end one of these on time? Huh? Do you ever end one of these things on time? No, no, not usually. You got to be usually. the class clown and the school principal, and they're going, all right, kids, gather up. Let's move it out. You kind of got to play it by ear by the amount of people in the chat. I, I see we still got about 150 some odd people in, but it starts tapering off after a while. So, yeah, I'm impressed. But, I, I, yeah. You know, I'd like to thank everybody just before we go of who, who watched and came in and thank you and, and thank James for coming on and anybody that came on live and asked questions. It's really yeah. cool. It's a very nice experience to um, to connect with other people, even though it's on a computer. And uh, yeah, I, I've been sure. missing that. I haven't had that a lot. I, I think a lot of us haven't. So thank you. Appreciate so what was the coldest uh, actually, you ever you ever camped in? Hammock camped in, Shug? Uh, minus 80. Minus, so, oh, oh, don't, <laughs> confuse <them>. don't confuse them. Don't confuse them. Minus yeah. 40. 40 is that, eh? that's, that's cold. That's frigid. Yeah. Actually, that's it's cold. been a pleasure it, it was, chatting it, with you both. This has been it was awesome. Otherworldly. It was, um, you know, there was no wind. I'll just tell you a quick thing. We were on this lake. <laughs> so we walked out in the middle of the lake and uh, Strung Out, who works with me, he makes these flashlights. They're tactile. They're like what cops and military put on their rifles to really illuminate. And he can light that thing up and it it's so bright. But there were just ice crystals. It wasn't snow, just dropping straight down, just fluttering. Every star was red and green looking through these crystals. It was absolutely still. Trees popping. It was just a lunar cold. It was, it was fantastic. But it was the most different experience I've ever felt on Earth, just going, I know a lot of people have been in that kind of cold, but to go out and be out in a couple of days was just really a treat. And... Uh, Thinking back, people ask me if I like want to do it again. Going, I, I don't know. I don't think so. Uh, I'll take minus twenty, minus thirty. But uh, you know, we just end up going. It's like you canoers. You know, lake weather so wild. What you were talking about, uh, James. You know, mother di mother nature always dictates the trip. She's yeah. in charge of whatever happens out there, and we just have to roll with it and do our best, or you'll never go again. Yeah, you know, it, it's just one of those things that just sort of reminds you and. And once and once she puts you in your place, you just re, you realize, okay, yeah, okay, my fault, my fault. Then you enjoy it all that yeah. much more. You know, it's just such a sense of accomplishment. And then you go out every you, as much as you can. You just enjoy it. Yeah. it it's just a, it's about getting out there, using oh. the gear you got, right? And maybe getting a canoe. Yep. Yeah. Hey guys, so Shug. Yes, sir. Stick around. Thank you very much, guys, for uh, coming up on panel and agreeing to do this. Uh, you shared a lot of wisdom. Uh, I'm sure we could still go on for hours. I say that at the end of every show, too. Uh, for anybody that's in the chat, you know what? If you want a wealth of information, head over to Shug's channel, and he's got oodles and oodles and oodles of videos on winter camping. 
Check out James at uh, little, the little shop of hammocks.com. Is that correct? You betcha. Yep. All the links are in the description below. You could check them out. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Everybody in the uh, chat and those of you that come up and ask questions on panel, thanks very much. The participate, participation in these shows is what uh, I really look forward to. Uh, it, it makes it a lot easier on me so I don't have to keep asking all the questions. Uh, that's all good stuff. And you know what, Shug? I think everybody's been kind of waiting for this all night. I'm going to let you close Woo! this show. Everybody! That, yeah. <laughs> you know, I never said oh. I look at my first video and I hollered that out and I had never said that before. <laughs> yeah. Give us one more. Okay. <laughs> Here's the one I do when I'm by myself and the camera's not ready. Woo, buddy. Woo, buddy. <laughs> I, I saw Woo, buddy. I am such a loser. I don't know how to camp or winter camp. And then the camera comes on. I go, woo, buddy. And woo, buddy is a, it is kind of my prayer when I'm out there. It's a, it's a prayer. It's glee. It's joy. It's Elon. It's verve. It's thankfulness. It's a, it's a welcome. It's an, I'm glad to be here. Uh, look where I am. That's what woo buddy is because I'm, I'm like a child. I'm like an old child. And, I'm just excited inside and, and I don't ever really ever say it in real life. It's sort of saved for those moments, you know, when I need it and, and when I'm in the woods and maybe we all have those ramblings or a saying or a thought that we get when we step into the woods. And I don't know if you guys have ever experienced it, but sometimes I get, I get on a trip, I get up to the trailhead, I get on trail and for the, I've had these trips where like for the first 20, 30 minutes, I sort of had a sense of melancholia. I don't know if it was like, I should I be out here? Maybe I did. I did. I not get things done. Did I leave my wife the right way? But <laughs> then it just goes away and it turns into, Woo, buddy, look where I am. I don't care. Why do I care what anybody thinks? So, you know, I don't know. The woods makes you, um, it gives you a self check. You have to really look inside, you know, and as a guy who's a clown, we put, you know, my acting teacher once told me, she said, you know, Sean, you're, you're just a very external person. You're all over here <laughs> and we're going to get to your internal more. And I think the woods for me, it can get back. I get more in touch with my internal till you turn the camera on and it is like a little friend, but you're feel like you're sharing this trip with people after you've been doing YouTube a while. And I don't always want to be, I joke it sometimes I go, day two, I'm still out here. My feet hurt. <laughs> you know it's like I, I watched the guy's video that was like that once and i was just so engrossed by his uh stay five still walking sad cold feet hurt i hate ramen noodles and i kept wondering, <laughs> what a great hook uh so thanks everybody and dennis thank you you're a great moderator and i know it takes a lot of work to put these kind of things together and everybody out there that's commenting that hasn't subscribed to his channel, could you please? I don't. I will never ask you to subscribe to mine. I'm going to ask you to subscribe to Dennis. Thanks, Shug. Appreciate All right, that. Man. We're still growing. We're still growing. Anyways, everybody in the chat, right. thanks again, Shug. Thanks again, James. Stick around thanks for the green room. Okay. We'll see you, you all next time. Thanks, everybody. Week. Check out the Facebook page, Canoe Hounds Outdoor Adventure Show, and you'll know exactly what's happening next week. Have a great night, everybody, and remember, keep the adventures alive. And how things in Sector 7? Yes, sir. Well, <laughs> I kind of like to sit out here in my shop and stare at the wall and look at my down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My mother comes out and reads me a book about paddling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a book about crafting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's hard That's to shut this can. off, man. <laughs> <laughs> See you later, everybody. Right, bye, everybody. Thanks. See ya. <laughs>